Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Wednesday, January 9th, 2019. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Professor of Political Science from the University of Maryland, Chris Miller. Her book, Poor Representation, Congress and the Politics of Poverty in the United States. Meanwhile, Trump did nothing again last night, and everybody seems to know it. And as polls turn on the GOP and Republican senators begin to fold in the Senate, where is Mitch McConnell? Also on the program today, TSA quitting over the shutdown. Affordable housing contracts set to expire. Housing and transit projects brought to a screeching halt. We're not even at the longest shutdown ever yet, still a day or two days away. And Paul Manafort's either got the worst lawyers in America or is trying to signal to Donald Trump that he lied to Robert Mueller about sharing polling data with Russian intelligence agents. CBO is set to score single payer. I think this is for the first time ever. And as Dem mayors and governors push local single payer plans, public options, ish ish. Trump on Twitter tells FEMA to end funding to fight California forest fires. Got to change the subject a little bit. Action. And rake it. the Dems stop a vote in the Senate attacking people's right to boycott Israeli products. Oh, no. 1.4 ex-felons now allowed to vote in Florida and L.A. teachers set to strike. Lastly, feel proud, America. Our CIA director may have actually run two different black sites. But she's a woman. Yes, Queen. Rachel Maddow. Lean in. The Lean Guantanamo in. story. The Guantanamo <laughs> story. <laughs> A lot of people thought that women couldn't attach electrodes to people's genitals. Well, she proved them wrong. First All <laughs> this and more on today's program, ladies and gentlemen. What was, uh, Brendan, what was the uh, show um, when I went to Pittsburgh for uh, the uh, AFT conference? Do you have the date on that? Find that out here. Let me see if I. Uh, still working on that, uh, folks. Well, the point being, um, 1881. in 1881, it was in 1881. What? Uh, oh, that was the episode. Like num- that was the episode that number. Ago. 1881. So that was over 120 episodes ago. Oh, I was gonna. That's what I was gonna do. <laughs> I was gonna do this like uh, 
the show was back in 1881. What was the date I just of that declare show? I'm tired greatly from my travel. Reconstruction's you see. not going well. <laughs> New reconstruction's <laughs> not going yeah. well. But here's the thing. What was the uh, date of that? It was over the summer, right? July 13th, July 13th in 2018. Um, uh, folks, to to get a sense of of at the very least what the mood that um, and 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 what the attitude towards uh, strikes are, particularly in a post Janus world and in a post strikes in um, uh, West Virginia and Oklahoma and uh, Arizona, uh, there was one or two other states over the course of the summer where we saw uh, teachers strikes by unions that were far less um, organized. Maybe that's the wrong word, but uh, institutionalized. Some of them weren't even unions officially. Right. I mean, that's uh, the right to work states. Uh, they don't they they just didn't have the same uh, internal apparatus. Um, the UTLA, I think, is the second largest, maybe the first largest um uh teachers union local in the country obviously um and it is uh the same folks from the AFT it's a uh, a local chapter of the a AFT i don't know if they quite organized that way but um worth going back listening to some of those um those union leaders and um or uh, teacher leaders talk about what they learned during that know that the leaders of the UTLA were at that same conference. These were things that they were all talking about. And uh, as teachers, um, as, as these folks feel more empowered, we're going to see hopefully more labor action. And um, it's going to start with the teachers. Uh, and, then, and then we'll see from there. So keep an eye on this. And it's uh, a real bottom-up thing, not top-down, importantly. Yeah, I think very much so. And that I think you, you get a sense of that um, when you hear those folks talk. And I think to a certain extent, it has brought the leadership of the union. It's moved them. Um, what, the theme that I got from from coming out of there was whether it was from Randy Weingarten. And I think it, we ran the Randy Weingarten interview afterwards. I don't know if it was actually while we were there. Um, the thing I got from my conversation with her and from these other uh, local union leaders were that they had forgotten or underestimated the power and the value of a, a uh, work action, of a labor action, and that they were they, they to the extent that they had regret was that they hadn't used it earlier, and so I think. Um, to the extent that going forward, we're going to see anybody air, it's going to be airing on the side of actually more uh, action rather than less, which is, um, I suspect, a there's a much greater margin for air uh, on that side, uh, particularly long term. And, and, and look, when you're talking about teachers, they have the best opportunity of social um, social action unionization insofar as they have a a more organic relationship with the community than most workers because teachers are in demand parents want to talk to them they have relationships with people outside of uh, of the schools and outside of their union that are uh, not necessarily, they don't have to go out and look for these people. <laughs> the people look for them. Um, and so um, it, it provides the model, and then just figuring out how to deepen those ties, I think, is going to be the challenge. So uh, keep an eye on this. We'll see. They are, um, you know, we're not clear if they're going to strike yet, but um, it is not just over pay. And I think we reported the other day that because of low pay around the country, um, municipalities, counties are having trouble recruiting new teachers. And um, the experience of 
uh, race to the top and no child left behind also, I think, was uh, very demoralizing for teachers in terms of the narrowness in which they had in um, executing and developing curriculum. And uh, so it, it, being a teacher has become a harder job and even, if you can imagine, a less thankful one uh, in many respects. Um, and so it's not just a question of pay. They want smaller class sizes and they want more support in the, the schools, more nurses, more counselors, more librarians. Um, these are the support staff type of folks um, are, are the first cut when there are major cutbacks to education. And education has been under assault uh, across the country, short of some very wealthy um, areas of the country where because of the way that we fund schools, they can fund their schools uh, much better than in other areas of the country. Um, but apparently, n over 98% of the voting members of the UTLA, that's the United Teachers of Los Angeles. There's um, 31,000 teachers. 98% of them voted to strike, to authorize the strike. That's, um, that's pretty much unanimity. Wow. And if any uh, politically aware, informed, and active young people are listening to this right now, and trying to figure out, you know, a career for yourself, being a teacher might be pretty great. You can make a difference on so many fronts, including labor. There you go. Um, and if you're, um, if you're a student out in L.A., uh, I imagine there's opportunity for you to do some organizing in anticipation of supporting your teachers. Um, don't get yourself kicked out of school. Um, you know, be careful. You don't have the same sort of pr organized protections, but um, there's there's a whole host of things you can do without getting in trouble. You want to get in trouble? Listen to the Antifada, and they'll explain to how to do that, but I'm not going to take that True responsibility. True that. Um, meanwhile, uh, last night, uh, the <laughs> if, if you want to know why, the Republicans are so relentlessly obsessed with AOC. And frankly, uh, the media is, too. It's because um, she there. I mean, you could see this set out last night. Don Trump goes on. He gives a five minute speech. It appears and I haven't seen reporting specifically to this uh, effect. But it appears that they they must have chickened out about uh, declaring a state of emergency. Because if there was a time to do it, it was last night. Like you can't go up on a, uh, on, a, on, a, on a Tuesday and say things are really bad at the border and then expect to come back on Friday. Like, in fact, it's a state of emergency. <laughs> you can't do that, right? Like if it's not a state of emergency last night, there's no way it can be a state of emergency uh, on Friday. Now, look, they can do whatever they want and they're going to, but that doesn't explain why they didn't do it last night. Because the only thing that's going to happen going forward is that, and you have now already, I think it's three or four Republican senators who are all already starting to wave the white flag. And Donald Trump last night could have said it's a state of emergency. I'm going to take money from the military and I'm going to build uh, the wall. Somebody along that process, and I suspect it was either the military um, themselves or um, uh, members of the Senate who represent the military or the, somewhere along that line, somebody said something serious enough like you can't do this. And so they didn't. And they were left with this hollow shell of a just jibber jabber. Nobody cared. Nobody cares. I mean, if Donald Trump's not off the teleprompter, it's not fun. And if he's not doing anything, what's the point? Just to prove that he could read a five minute speech. Get everyone's attention. I proved it. I mean, the was there anybody in the country who was like, wow, I've never seen him so emotionally invested. He was really upset about that. 
Like at one point he said something like, I held the hands of, uh, I can't even remember who he said he held the hands mothers. of. Mothers. Uh, of mothers. And mm. nobody believes that. What, who would want to hold his hand? Germs. He's never held a hand in his of life. Of course. And I, I actually touched a cadaver once. And so he went on there. Now, uh, Pelosi and Schumer did exactly what you would anticipate they would do. Um, anyone in here could have written what they were going to say, and they uh, delivered it, uh, you know, about as uh, inspiringly as you could expect. I did have people who, who texted me were like, Chuck Schumer really hit it out of the park. I was like, seriously? Okay. But the bottom line is they did, they just, they basically did what you need to do in those rebuttals. Not embarrass yourself and, you know, just show up. So that there's some semblance of like, um, and, and, and from a polling standpoint, it's working, slowly working. I suspect that Mitch McConnell is afraid of bucking Donald Trump right now because he's got to run in 2020. And this is exactly the time that somebody would say, hey, I'm going to run against Mitch McConnell. People forget in 2016, Mitch McConnell was the enemy in the Republican Party. And if he was to cross Donald Trump right now and capitulate at this point to those uh, Republican senators and actually bring a bill up on the floor, continuing uh, resolution, I think he's afraid of Donald Trump uh, calling, saying mean things about him and inspiring a, um, a challenge to him. Cocaine but in, Mitch. in the absence of that, this is why what AOC uh, does is so important because uh, Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi are going to play four corners. They're just going to make no mistakes because that is generally been the Democratic uh, recipe for attempting to do something. Really stake out almost no position and uh, wait uh, until, you know, the Republicans overstep their bounds. Now, it has not been uh, terribly successful long term. It might be in the short term moment. But um, here is AOC on Rachel Maddow and um, I don't get the sense this was terribly scripted because at one point she just sort of she just goes off. Um, and uh, this is th frankly, this clip is probably going to be the one of the three. Address uh, addresses to the what's going on at the border, which really is relative to uh, at any other time. Nothing. Um this is going to be the one that's going to travel the most and has the most poignance and really is most on point. And no one should feel unsafe in the United States of America. And that includes our, our amazing and beautiful and productive immigrant community. And moreover, the one thing that the president has not talked about is the fact that he has systematically engaged in the violation of international human rights borders on uh, human rights on our border. He has separated children from their families. He talked about what happened the day after Christmas on the day of Christmas, a child died in ICE custody. The president should not be asking for more money to an agency that has systematically violated human rights. The president should be really defending why we are funding such an agency at all. Because right now, what we are seeing is death. Right now, what we are seeing is the violation of human rights. These children and these families are being held in what are, what are called yeleras, which are basically freezing boxes that no person should be maintained in for any amount of time, let alone the amount of time that they are being kept on. And moreover, even if you are anti-immigrant, in this country, the majority of immigrant overstays, the majority of the reason that people are undocumented is visa overstay. It's not because people are crossing a border illegally. Uh, it, is, it is because of visa overstay, which, mind you, he's talking about legal immigration. He's trying to restrict every form of legal immigration there is in the United States. Mm. He's fighting against family reunification. He's fighting against the diversity visa lottery. He's fighting against almost every way that people can actually legally enter this country, forcing them to become undocumented, and then he's trying to attack their undocumented status. This
this is systematic, it is wrong, and it is anti-American. And again, those women and children trying to come here with nothing but the shirts on their back to create an opportunity and to pr provide for this nation are acting more in an American tradition than this president is right now. I mean, it's sort of amazing. She's driving the news cycle for like three days in a row. And... Um, it's not hard to do that when you're the only person on the mainstream media who's acting like a human being, right? Well, I mean, uh, it, 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 I, I haven't seen it. Uh, I mean, it doesn't happen too often. I mean, I think, you know, uh, Bernie uh, got to prominence after running for president. Uh, prior to that, he would never, ever get on the news. He also had a, his response, too, was also very effective in his own, you know, also direct kind of no BS way. More I do on picture the fun half. More, exactly. I picture um, Schumer sort of like if this was a if they were on a basketball court, like AOC's just out sinking threes, and then Schumer sidles up. He's like, "Take a look at this." <laughs> then proceeds I, to I, my, like like just my guess not be able to sink a my a guess is that they're happy with this at least on this topic on this topic definitely they're happy oh, with what she's course. doing no because doubt. No doubt. they get to have their uh they get to you know be the reasonable middle i, I honestly i watched they're uh what sure. they said and i the only thing i can remember about what uh pelosi and schumer said was nothing the only thing i remember was schumer looking like he is like uh, he wouldn't even acknowledge that Pelosi was next to him as, as she was talking. It was very He was weird. just looking very straightforward. And then I noticed like he moved a little bit like he was like I could. I've been in that situation you where you're like, how much, am I supposed, the camera. How, much, how much am I supposed to acknowledge about what she's saying? And it just looked very odd. It looked like American under, Gothic. You yeah. don't understand how the camera works, Mr. Sex in the City. I had a credit <laughs> in the 90s and I go on and on about it. You stare into space and you let us speak. He, he honestly, I'll see you in 2022, but, but, you prick. But I'm sure he's quite. Uh, I'm sure he's quite uh, happy that um, she is is pushing one end of this argument. I mean, this she's there for calling for the abolishment of ICE. This is the good. Yeah, this is where the like, center left thing works for everybody. Yes. in that and what the Democratic Party is, which is really a coalition of par of parties. That's what it would be in Europe, and this is an example of you know, how that actually works in concert together, because right now, of course, the longer term goals are abolish ice and so on. But the short term goal right now is crush Trump and do anything you can on things like temporary protective status for Haitians and DACA. And they're actually in concert on this right now. No yeah, doubt. There's certainly a coalition on this. But, you know, like AOC herself said, not all Democrats are the same. And when you are coming at something from such diff like he harped for probably as long about how the wall is ineffective and inexpensive as he did about children being separated from their parents and like dying in cages. Like let's, let, let's prioritize yes, what's yes, important well, here. Right, right. Okay. All right. We got to take a break and, uh, and um, uh, we'll be right back with Chris Miller. Back, Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It's a pleasure to welcome to the program uh, professor of political science at the University of Maryland, uh, Chris Miller, on her book, Poor Representation, Congress 
and the politics of poverty in the United States. Uh, Professor, welcome to the program. Thanks so much for having me. All right. Well, let's um, let's uh, start with, I guess, the um, what, what the two questions that you seem to focus on in the book are uh, one is, are the poor represented at all in Congress? And to the extent that they are, how does that happen? Let's let's start with the the, the first question. Um, are they represented at all? <laughs> that is the good good question to start with. Um, yeah. So this first question, um, I guess the to give away the punch right at the beginning is not really all that well. Um, so the the place that I start with is just trying to get a sense of um, you know what does Congress do overall. Um, is Congress talking about the poor? And so I really uh, start off by kind of taking up this myth about the invisible poor, and I debunk it at the beginning. Um, so we have this notion sometimes that the poor are politically invisible, um, and that's simply not true. And I think that's an important place to start and where I begin kind of in, in my book, because if they were invisible, then legislators and politicians not acting for them um, could just be thought of as kind of benign neglect. And if only we could make our legislators more aware of the poor and of poverty, then problems would be solved, right? So the solution then would be kind of an awareness one. Um, but I don't think that's what's really going on. And so when I go and I look going back to the 1960s at State of the Union addresses from presidents of both parties, I look at the party platforms from the Republican and the Democratic parties, um, and I look at what constituents, what groups they're talking about, and across the board, the poor are mentioned quite frequently. Um, and they're mentioned more than the middle class, they're mentioned more than farmers, than seniors, than veterans. So the, the first answer was, okay, is this realistic to even be asking my first question, are the poor represented in Congress? Um, because some folks would say, well, that's, that's not a really good question because, you know, people don't think about the poor. And so first I had to start off and say, well, you know what? Actually, they are. They are politically visible. And so then, you know, the question becomes, so what's happening? Um, and I think about it first as like Congress overall. So just thinking like how many bills are introduced, how many hearings are held, how many laws are passed. And I find that overall it's a really low number. So we're talking less than 3% of the overall congressional agenda, um, meaning you know, about 1% of laws passed, about 3% of bills even introduced. And this is going back again decades. Um, so Congress is not taking up a lot. Um, interestingly, when poverty increases in society, you might think Congress would do more. That doesn't seem to be the case. You might think as poverty kind of spreads geographically, so more congressional districts would be affected, maybe then Congress does more. And it doesn't seem to be the case. So it's not really responsive. Um, and it's generally pretty low. Now, that said, 3% of the agenda, if you want to be glasses half full, still means that something is going on. Um, and so, as you said, that's kind of the second part of the book. Okay. All right. So let's, I mean, I just want to uh, uh, tease some of this out. So when we talk about yeah. invisibility, um, we're, what we're really talking about is to the extent that it enters the rhetoric of the body politic, right? Because, I mean, as we get right. to the second part, if you defined, if you defined invisibility as actually sort of like, I guess, present, you know, like, it, you know, like, like um, um, in close proximity to those in power, it might be something different. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, I'm just going off because of, like there was a report. Um, I mean, it, it, this, that, sort of, I guess, um, perspective, just, there was a report, um, yeah, I think it was a piece that was written up in the Washington Post, and there was a, a, a paper um, from uh, someone at the Columbia and the University of California that said that uh, Congress thinks that the, um, uh, the public is more conservative than it is because they're so exposed to lobbyists. I would imagine that and uh, the report doesn't say anything about this, but I would also imagine the Congress probably thinks that the American public, like they 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 don't have a sense of 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 poor people except are as a sort of like as a rhetoric, right? Like I can talk about a ghost yeah. um, that that <laughs> may very well be invisible, and I can talk about that ghost all the time, but it doesn't really implicate me because I, I you know 
you can put your hand through them and they're not around or whatever. I mean. No, I think that's right. And I mean, I think it gets at two parts of it, which is one is there, there has been at least going back to the 1950s and 60s, this sense that, you know, we just don't see the poor, particularly political elites are not aware of them because they don't, um, you know, live in the same neighborhoods, they don't attend the same educational institutions, things like that. And so that there's a lack of awareness that makes it easy to neglect issues that would affect the poor and poverty more generally. And so by focusing on the political rhetoric, um, and particularly something like the State of the Union, which is televised, which is the president speaking to the nation and speaking to all the members of Congress, you know, when you see repeatedly that the poor are getting mentioned in that really high profile venue more often than middle class, more often than seniors, definitely more often than the rich. Um, but when they're so prominent in those types of speeches, it's really hard to, to say that people are not, the political elites are not aware of them. Now, I think you raise a really important question, which is, you know, rhetoric and awareness in that sense is not the same thing as having um, a kind of intuitive understanding of what poverty means, of what the problems uh, that the poor face in their everyday lives are really about. And I think that's still a dimension on even when you have political speech and rhetoric, you don't necessarily have that understanding. Um, and so I think one type of diversity uh, that Congress uh, could use more of is certainly kind of an economic or class-based diversity um, and having people from different backgrounds with different life experiences simply because those personal experiences matter so much in how we understand other people's lives and how we understand what government is doing well, what it could be doing. Um, and so I think that question of kind of economic diversity in the body Congress itself is a, a huge issue and is really important. Um, now, obviously, that would be kind of one thing to solve. I realize I couldn't do this in the book. So, you know, I, I do think that um, even politicians who don't have personal experience with poverty or maybe don't have a working class background themselves, they could still be aware of it. They can still raise it. Um, you know, and that type of representation traditionally is part of how we think about things. And, you know, you see people like the former Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, um, who would often talk about poverty. And he put forth a blueprint about addressing poverty and, and gave speeches about it. But if you look at the legislative uh, actions, right, you don't see actions there. And so there is this gap between uh, rhetoric and what Congress does. I, I, I want to um, I want to I, I want to uh, get back to that sort of that, that gap and why mm -hmm. there is no um, you know, why why like why that gap is sustainable right on, on on both ends and why it exists right because because if there's no price to be paid if for the false promises why make them in the first place i mean and and maybe that that's outside of 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 your portfolio but le just in terms of representation when we when we measure that i mean when you say um the legislation is only you know a three percent like what how do you, uh, before we move on to question two, how do you quantify that? Um, I mean, is it, uh, are you looking at sort of dollars that are earmarked towards uh, the poor or uh, time spent investigating questions of people living in poverty? What, what just give us a, 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 just a, a brief understanding of how we assess the lack of, you know, what representation means um, in and of itself. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, with the concept as big as representation, there's lots of ways to come at this. But the way that I do it in the book, and that I think makes a lot of sense, obviously, um, is I'm really looking at the, the substantive legislation. And so that could be the bills that are introduced, regardless of how far they move in the process. Um, that's a primary focus, but also maybe looking at which bills make it to a hearing, which bills make it to a vote and whether they pass or not. And the reason I focus on the actual legislation is because I'm really interested um, in what Congress is doing, right? That's kind of the, the focus. Although I look at some of the rhetoric and I look at some of the other aspects, my interest is really, is Congress doing this part of its job? Um, and we tend to think in representation that 
um, you know, the output that we're looking for generally is the substance of the legislation. So that's what I focus on. And there, what I do is I look at all the bills that are introduced into the House of Representatives, which is my focus here, um, going back to the early 1980s, so about 30, 31 years of legislation. And um, not to totally, you know, dork out into academics, but there's this great resource called the Policy Agendas Project that catalogs all of this and makes it, um, you know, more user friendly. And, and through that, what I did was I went through and I coded by topic. So they have major topics and over 200 subtopics. And what I look for are things that are relevant to poverty. Um, and so, of course, some of that is going to be things like uh, social welfare programs, food assistance, but I also look at other areas, including things like um, education programs targeted to underprivileged students, so things like Head Start, um, education uh, for rural education initiatives, uh, disadvantaged students more generally. I look at job training. I look at uh, tax breaks, um, economic opportunity acts, things of that sort, um, also things related to housing, so um, some of the assistance that goes for heating and energy in low-income households, um, rent control programs and rent assistance, incentives for developers to build affordable housing. So all of these different types of programs I qu classify as being poverty-relevant or poverty-related. And it was really important to me to make this specifically about poverty. So for that reason, I don't include things like Social Security um, because – I think a, a legislator acting on Social Security doesn't necessarily have representing poor people in mind, even if some uh, benefit is spillover. But I focus on more targeted programs uh, that single out low-income and poor uh, recipients. And I try to do it across a pretty inclusive range of substantive areas. So like I said, education and housing and jobs and economic. And also I include things like tax incentive programs um, so that this isn't solely about creating um, new federal programs, which we might think would lean towards Democrats being more active. So I wanted to be really careful to also include the types of proposals that Republicans um, might be more likely to include. And so uh, that's part of why I look at anti-poverty efforts like tax-based tools, uh, the end income tax credit, uh, and things of that sort as well. So that's how I'm thinking about it. Okay, and so let's move on to the uh, the question of, of, of how does that representation occur. One would, I think, uh, first guess would be um, that representation, and the, the activity that you see, whether it's hearings or introduction of legislation, uh, would be a function of representatives uh, who come from districts that are um, there's a higher incidence of, of poverty in those um, in those districts, and that's not necessarily the case, is it? No, and and I totally agree with you. That's where I was coming from too. Um, my clear expectation here was that even if the overall levels weren't very high, what you would expect to find is that those people who those legislators representing the the districts with higher poverty would be the ones doing more. Maybe it's not a ton, but it's more than the others, right? And this makes sense. It's like we expect representatives from um, rural districts with a lot of farmers to be more active on agriculture. So this is kind of a both a conventional wisdom and academically holds up um, that you expect to see this type of relationship between who's in the district and what their member does. And so the most shocking thing to me when I was working on this project and kind of remains the thing that, that I always um, – you know, uh, come back to is that that's not what I find. Um, and so there's really not evidence of this at all. And this is this is really striking. So poverty across congressional districts can range from 2 percent to more than 35 percent. And so this non finding um, basically is saying that knowing the percent of poverty in the district does not help us predict or understand what a legislator does. A legislator with 2 percent poverty or 20 percent poverty is equally likely or unlikely to sponsor bills related to poverty. And if you stop and think about it, that's really weird when we think about congressional representation. Um, it just goes against what we think representation ought to look like. Um, and, you know, like I said, overall the levels are low, but it was this disconnect between members and who's in their district um, that, that I found um, really to be both surprising but also really important to know about. Um, now, that said, you know, 
some bills are getting passed, which then brought on the second or I guess maybe third question um, of who are the legislators who are doing stuff. So there's not that many of them, right? About 77 percent of Congress, members of Congress never sponsor any bills related um, to poverty. So but of those that do, my first thought was it should be those from poor districts. That turns out to not be true. Um, so then I start looking more closely at those who are. Um, they are more likely to be Democrats. They are more likely to be African-American legislators. And they're more likely to be women. Um, so those were the patterns that I did find. And again, they're not more likely to come from poor districts. Um, so this was really kind of then turned to this, this last part of um, how does the representation occur? And I start focusing on these legislators who act for the poor, even though the poor are not particularly connected to their district. Um, and in political science, we call this surrogate representation. In my book, I talk about them as being champions of the poor, as legislators who consistently are active on poverty issues and kind of what drives that and what are they bringing to the table. So what is it? And so and when we say surrogate, we should just be clear that, that the, the implication is that um, – the you're 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 not necessarily representing a significant or a i guess statistically significant in terms of uh of of comparison uh number of people living in poverty uh in your district so what is it um aside from that correlation with democrats uh people of color women what else is there is there a through line beyond that or is it just like oh these are the you know, X number of people who actually are, you know, decent human beings? <laughs> well, we don't want to go that far. Um, no. Uh, so I think, you know, this notion of surrogate representation sounds funny, but it's basically like, like you were saying, it's this idea, like when we think there's a, a female elected from a certain state, she may not be your representative, but the idea is she kind of speaks for women more broadly. So that's the basic idea. Um, and there aren't, e even with these correlates of, of, being more likely to be Democrats, of African-Americans, of women, it still is not to say that all Democrats or African-Americans or women are particularly active on poverty issues. You know, using some standards or thinking about are they consistently active, we're talking about just a few dozen uh, legislators that are reliably introducing legislation related to poverty, and that's out of more than, you know, close to 1,400 legislators over three decades. So this still is a pretty small percentage, to be quite honest. Um, and I think, you know, in terms of through lines of, of what unifies them, I think some of them really do come to the issue just out of a pure conviction um, of policy interest and, and their own interest in the policy area, because it's not electorally motivated. It's not based in the district. And one of the most striking things that I find when I look at these uh, surrogate representatives or these champions is that the substance of the type of poverty legislation that they introduce is very much related to who it is. So um, one kind of cluster of these surrogate representatives, the oh. bills that they're introducing, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. Uh, we just had a little glitch, but go ahead. Oh, so I was just going to say, when you look at what they introduce, they're more likely to think about things like okay, let's introduce legislation to pick up the slack of if a, uh, a woman who's receiving, uh, say, food assistance for herself and her family loses a job due to sexual harassment, right? How do we bridge that work requirement that might be tied to her benefits? So they're coming at some of these poverty issues through a more gendered lens, and I find that um, that exists for the other kind of clusters of types of surrogate representatives. So who is active really also matters for the substance of the policy that's put on the table in Congress. Um, so, so what is, I mean, is it, is it, is it, is it possible that the question is being asked from, I mean, to, to sort of like determine why there is, why there is this big Delta, right? Between the amount that poverty is referenced in the context of rhetoric versus the action, it seems to me is a function of there is no price to be paid. Like you can make false promises uh, about poverty and there's no accountability. And is that a function of the lack of political power of, of, of people 
living in poverty? Is it a function that they don't vote as much? I mean, I, I, I mean, I think this is um, I think there's data to support that people on Medicaid simply don't vote at rates like uh, uh, wealthier people. Now, there's there's all sorts of reasons maybe behind that. But the the um, the reason the the implication of that is that you can make all these promises and uh, you can write all these checks and they never get cashed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think that's right. And fundamentally, that's that's a problem in politics, right? It's, it's maybe more acute on issues with poverty, um, but kind of politicians making promises that they don't fulfill um, is, is something that we see more often than we would like. Um, and I think you're right in pointing out kind of two primary explanations for those. Let me take up one of them first, which is um, kind of do they have political power, do the poor? And I think one uh, important thing to point out here is that there really is a, a scarcity of institutional voices advocating for the poor. And here I'm thinking about things like interest groups, right? I mean, whether you like it or not, um, the interest group community is an important part of the policy community in Washington, D.C., and there are far more interest groups and organized interests advocating for other issues than there are for the poor. Um, and that matters. Uh, that matters because it's it's not able to raise the salience in off offices. It, it means that um, the constituents back in the district are losing kind of one of the primary megaphones of democracy, um, again, like it or not, but is organized interest, right? They give a voice to people. And so as there are fewer interest groups um, advocating for the poor, that puts the poor at a relative disadvantage in attracting the attention of the legislators. Um, and that's something that's important to think about because legislators have a lot of people trying to catch their attention. They have limited time um, and there's limited policy space. And so you need to make yourself known and you need to put yourself right there in front of them and say, this is something you need to take up. Um, and by having fewer advocates, that's harder for the poor. So I think that's a, a significant part of the story. Um, I think the other part you mentioned, which is about kind of the electoral consequences, is really interesting. Um, it is true that the poor vote at lower rates, but it's not as much lower as we might think, um, especially when you're looking at federal elections, so congressional and presidential uh, races. The poor vote a little bit less than the next income group, but it's not that big of a drop off. Um, and so I think um, that there could be electoral consequences. There is also the possibility that people who themselves aren't poor still want their representatives to be responsive to this, to take up these issues and to try to alleviate poverty. So I think that poverty issues are not just appealing to poor voters, right? Um, that's something that many middle income and upper income people would like to see addressed too. Um, you know, we'll see where this goes. I think the 2016 election um, brought about, you know, more populist rhetoric, both on the right and the left that we had seen. Um, but we don't see a lot of policy implications to that, um, you know, whether or not there's an electoral payback for that. You know, we can think about 2018 um, and certainly thinking ahead. You know, the question is, are voters going to say, hey, you talked a lot about helping out the little guy, about helping the poor, about helping the working class. And we're not seeing it. How much did the the um, attack and subsequent uh, dissolution of, of an organization like Acorn, how, how much could you could you see that in the data? I couldn't see that in the data, um, particularly because I didn't uh, I didn't have incorporated straight interest group data. Um, but I do think that interest groups, you know, it's it's not that big of a of a universe in terms of these types of um, either progressive or, or groups working for the poor specifically. And so, anytime one is lost or kind of uh, has headwinds. Um, it is a significant blow to the overall cause. Um, and so I think that, that that really does matter. How much, um, I mean, would the idea of universal programs, you know, sort of, uh, deal, if we saw this as a deficiency, as I do, mm -hmm. I think you probably do too, but I mean, as a society, if we saw this as a deficiency and mm -hmm. we see these um, uh, structural problems, to addressing questions of people living in poverty specifically. And we should say, right, like when we talk about people living in poverty, the, the, 
at any given time, that's a very fluid group of people, right? They move in and out of, of poverty, pe if people do. And so it's not necessarily um, a, a static group of people, and correct me if I'm wrong about that. But um, I guess what I'm saying is that the, is there a, uh, is one way to deal with this as a bit of a bank shot in making more universal programs that deal with people who may be living in poverty uh, but not exclusively. So like we, you know, yeah. you, you sequester social security, but the reality is we would have a lot more poverty were it not for social security. Uh, but it's a universal program. So it's not one perceived to deal directly with, uh, poverty. No, that's absolutely right. And when we think about um, I mean, a, a couple of things in terms of poverty, there are kind of different groups within it. So there is this group that you talked about that kind of comes in and out of poverty. Usually when they're out of poverty, they're in, in what we call near poverty. Right. So um, instead of meeting the exact limit of, of twenty four, twenty five thousand dollars a year for a family, they may cross over you know, into the upper twenty thousand. Um, it's not that that families usually fluctuate grossly up and down the, the economic ladder, but people do come in and out of technically qualifying as poverty. Um, but you also have pockets of real persistent poverty um, where it's multi it's intergenerational um, and for communities, it's kind of a long standing community problem. Um, so I think that, that we, you know, and, and part of this is recognizing that of course poverty is a very complex and multifaceted issue. And so some of the programs we need to think about both parts and it might not be that the same programs help equally to the kind of um, folks who are just on the cusp of poverty and kind of are extremely vulnerable and kind of precarious on that line, but do go back and forth between it and those who are, you know, in persistent poverty. Um, and we may need some of the same solutions and also some tailored solutions to that. Um, but more generally, this idea about universal programs is one that when we think about um, the impact of policy and how to uh, attract a, uh, support for certain programs, this is an argument um, that is made by many out there. And I think you're right. Certainly, if you bring up, you know, say, health care or um, some of the proposals, Medicare for all, or thinking about tuition, uh, free tuition for colleges or things of this sort are intended to kind of bring everybody up. And there's no doubt that those would improve the life of the poor. And I think politically are a savvy way to think about building that support and that coalition. Um, that said, for the purposes that I was looking at more narrowly, which were really about um, representation, about who gets heard and who doesn't. And so there I was looking specifically for places where the poor have a distinct interest and a distinct voice and is somebody bringing their issues and their perspectives to the conversation um, as being unique from thinking about uh, kind of the policy impact, in which case these types of universal programs uh, are an important part of the solution. Uh, Chris Miller, the book is Poor Representation, Congress, and the Politics of Poverty in the United States. Uh, thanks so much. Really appreciate your time today. Thanks so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Bye-bye. All right, folks. Going to head into the uh, fun half of the program. I mean, I guess the bottom line is if you want uh, people to um, – if you want uh, lawmakers who are going to um, support – people who are living in poverty uh look for a lawmaker who says they're going to support people living in poverty <laughs> i mean that's basically <laughs> i think what it uh, comes down to you're more likely to find those uh in the democratic party and uh, as people of color and of women um or look for a democrat who says that no one should be poor like our girl aoc right indeed um also, um, a just a reminder, uh, this program relies on your support. You can become a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. You have, um, uh, I know uh, Michael's going to talk about this briefly, uh, but you have, I think, uh, two more days um, to get your matching, your funds matched to uh, Nomiki Kunst if you're a uh, New York City voter. Uh, in her run for public advocate. M uh, Michael will talk about that uh, more because she was on uh, TMBS last night. I don't want to uh, step on any... Uh, any. Uh, you blew it. I blew it. But uh, 
Uh, you can support this program by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. When you do, we give you extra content uh, every day. And um, also, just coffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code majority, get 10% off. We're probably, I mean, I don't know what we're going to do with uh, uh, the uh, live show. We're going to use that as a, as a, uh, as a Monday show. I don't know. We should talk about that. Maybe use that as Monday's show. Monday off. Um, Monday off. What's that? We have a guest on Monday? Or maybe we'll use it on Tuesday's show. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but Or maybe it'll just end up as a member show. Not really sure. But uh, we just got uh, T-shirts that we're going to be selling at the uh, live show. Um, oh, yeah. Bring a lot of cash, folks. Uh, the T-shirts um, are going to be... Uh, tickets are only 15 bucks. T-shirts are going to cost you $75 uh, per T-shirt. And uh, we're also getting um, some sweet posters made. I think. I'm not sure. But w- what else do we have? Stickers? Uh, limited edition tote. Oh, yes. We have some of the, um, the limited edition tote bags. Those are uh, retro tote bags. Were those limited the last time we had a public show, too? They, they were the same, same ones. ones. Okay, yeah. Same ones. Those are good ones. Do you think I've so? got one of them at home. I, I use it. I like closet. it. I use it. <laughs> I have one in my closet. <laughs> Ringing These are uh, throwback tote bags. I think we got about five of them left. As opposed to those newfangled tote bags. And I'm actually thinking about like one of the ways I was thinking about cleaning out the uh, office here was to give away some of the Air America paraphernalia. Like I got that Air America um, windbreaker in the uh, closet, which I was thinking of maybe... Um, Maybe we'll, I don't know what we'll do with that. Just give it away or like uh, maybe do like a, an auction to benefit uh, a charity or something. That's like a that. collector's item. Yeah, for a collector. But uh, I'm not going to be a collector. Um, uh, don't forget, justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY, get 10% off. And, oh, uh, our, our members also get an uh, ad-free version of the show. I didn't have any ads today, but uh, some days we do. So, uh, Michael, last night was Tuesday. Indeed. And uh, my understanding is you had a show. We I can tell by all the bottles of uh, beer that are uh, still uh, sitting in their wastebasket. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I hope no, no, you also like the uh, beautiful uh, bottle of bourbon that you got as a gift, which Wait, you did didn't I? mention, you fool. I didn't know that was for me. That was for you specifically, you ungrateful. Be- Who so gave big. it to me? Our guest in the studio brought you a bottle of bourbon. That's why I asked you about it this morning. <laughs> oh, I didn't know. He gave me beer. Listener no, Matt brought in all the booze. Listener Matt brought you a beer for us, which we had a few of I apparently. Oh, some left over. Sorry that some That's a not good bottle up. of bourbon, that, that Koval. Was, that's I've had more that like it. All right. Well, I didn't realize. That is Thank more you, Matt. like I didn't, it. I didn't know. I thought that was your bourbon. You must be wearing orthotics because you stand I corrected. I had no idea. Oh. <laughs> that's my favorite hacky Borscht Belt joke um, um, so well no thank Mickey, you listener Matt yes thank listener Matt I didn't realize that okay no, I was I actually know. I was legit confused you had not thanked him before because I thought he left you a little note on it but anyways I saw a card but I didn't know what it that was that was for you Oh, I didn't know. I didn't look at it because Brendan look just at told things. me. I just saw that. I mean, I walked in. I was like, what's that bottle of bourbon? And Matt's, I mean, Brendan said, no, I just moved it. So, oh, Brendan, go. Oh, this tight move by Brendan and misinfo from you. Oh, drink up. I will. Well, oh, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah, it's not addressed to anybody. That's well, why I didn't know. Okay. It's communal. Wow. All right. Great. So, there you go. You're welcome. Oh, and he sells custom orthotics. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome on behalf of uh, TM. Is that where you got that joke? Did he tell no, you? No, I think that's a. Uh, I feel like. Did you know that he uh, he he was? He no, I actually really didn't know that. That's yeah, really funny. Orthotic. That's hilarious. <laughs> that's hysterical. Well, he's a um, he's a uh, I guess a, a he's a he's a physical therapist. Physical guy, therapist. Right? Yeah. Wow. That's that's Boom. synchronicity. That was synchronicity. Yogi. Hello, young. Yeah, so there was a Jungian moment um, when Sam was bitching, and then things turned when the bourbon was discovered. There was an orthotics joke, but what was actually going on? Something that emerged from the ether. No, Miki Konst was on. We talked about her agenda for New York City public advocate, which is actually, it seems to me like the type of position that should exist in any 
not even just any city, but really any town, like anywhere that requires any type of sort of additional oversight. It's a really interesting office. I feel like in some towns, if you had a, a position like that, that person would end up in a ditch. I think that that's super possible. And I, yeah, I don't want to put any bad energy out, but uh, she's refusing to take any real estate money. We talked about Amazon. We talked about the housing crisis, uh, Black Lives Matter agenda in New York City. Plus, we touched on the L.A. Uh, teacher strikes, and we did a bunch more in the main show. And then we have an unlocked post game where we did live coverage of Trump, the Sanders response. We talked about Bill, Bill, Bill Scenario, uh, and Bill Scenario. Dave Rubin's new uh, demo. Dave, Dave Rubin's new demographic material. Instead of like, are there any gay people here? It's are there any incels here? Anyone who wants to shoot up a Pilates studio here? Uh, so some new Dave Rubin material. Uh, Patreon.com slash TMBS. Get the whole thing. This Sunday, illicit history of Chavez and Bolivar with his former legal advisor. And I want to say tomorrow night, uh, there's an event uh, in Chelsea at 7 p.m. And it's the final fundraiser before the cycle closes for No Miki's campaign. It's at the Chelsea Music Hall at 7 p.m. There's going to be a lot of great musicians and performers. I'm giving like a little bit of a spiel there, too. And it's like the type of thing that, you know, if you give the suggested bottom donation is 27 bucks, and I think that becomes 250 bucks with the city matching funds. So come see us and support that campaign. Yeah, we'll put a link uh, to that on the, um, uh, on the blog today. And in the uh, post, I'll send, it, I'll send you one. Sure. Um, uh, Jamie, Intifada. Yeah, so this week we are back in a big way with our friend uh, Sophie Wiener, who is an editor at Splinter, as well as a romantic refugee, an American expat living in Australia. Um, we talk about the hell. Oh my gosh, it's too bad because Barry Weiss just came out with her piece about I Australia know. today. Oh, god damn it. I like, was, we might need to record a special addendum. That thing was uh, bad. I haven't read it yet. We do have a special hate on for her at the Antifada. Wait, was that the one where like Australians are super happy? Canada and a thong? Is that that one? Yeah. Well, the Canada and a thong came from and Sudaris, then, but okay. she said I don't that, mind that joke. I'm well, just but, but clear. We're, well, let Jamie say the thing and then we'll do the, uh, we'll talk about it. Uh, uh, yeah, I encourage anyone who wants to know about Australia to not read the Barry Weiss piece and listen to our episode instead because we talk about all kinds of things. Who's more racist, uh, indigenous rights, uh, Antifa in Australia, the senator who used taxpayer money to go hang out with Nazis. It's crazy. Um, we also end with a strong stand of Donald Trump's adoption of the Brezhnev Doctrine with regard to proletarian internationalism in the face of counter-revolution within 1970s to 80s Afghanistan. Tankies for Trump. Uh, and Matt? Uh, two books coming up. Probably the next one is going to be The House of the Seven Gables by Nathaniel Hawthorne. And then uh, Adam Tooze's uh, book on, that we talked about. I'm actually spacing on the name, but we had him on this show for it to talk about the uh, economic uh, crisis. And I'm talking with two guys who know more about economics than I do. Um, and so Literary Hangover, check it out. Um, How the fuck did that happen, bro? The oh, funny gonna, thing about that, Barry, uh, why, yeah, first of all, she right. said she said uh, she made some um, like observations of Australia that are fairly banal that I think were accurate. People essentially are not, um, you know, obsessed with what they do uh, for work uh, that largely speaking. And this was uh, true uh, when I was there for an extended period of time 25 years ago. It was probably a little less so now, but it was definitely, um, uh, you know, something that was obvious. Uh, they uh, work to live as opposed to, I think, in this country where we live uh, to work on some level. And, um, and then <laughs> she makes that observation, and then she makes the what she perceives as the completely unrelated observation, in fact, deficit, that economically, though, they, uh, that, that the country is like that hot girl uh, in, uh, this is the analogy she uses, the hot girl in freshman class who doesn't realize how pretty she is. Oh, my God. And right. there's something to that effect. It's tight. And the analogy is that they're great, but they don't, um, they don't have the economic ambition that they should have as a country. And right. the fascinating thing is like, she doesn't realize like on one hand, people 
live their life and enjoy themselves so much and they're not obsessed with what they do. But on the other hand, um, they're not striving enough as they want economically. And she doesn't realize that these two things are actually related. That the reason why you have a country full of people who enjoy their lives and put that first is because there isn't the relentless will to power and a desire to, uh, you know, not leave anything on the table in terms of economic advantage oh. and to, um, you know, in some respects, uh, provide for people broadly and not make it necessary that you uh, work relentlessly. I mean, uh, I, I don't know if it's still the case, but certainly 25 years ago, Almost every, and now it's more uh, popular, I think, in this country, but almost every Australian, when they would graduate uh, the equivalent of high school here, not every, but a significant number of them would then travel for like a year. But she's, I mean, for she, a year. she's also just, I mean, she's so like, Alex Perrine has this tweet where he says, I know like 400 left of center writers and editors who would never turn anything something this insipid and i feel like even people who quote unquote like her have to know this in their bones and it, it's like it's so dumb on so many levels but it's also essentially plagiarism right not literally but like thomas friedman would write this in like the late 90s about france when he made his globalization arguments they have a great lifestyle but actually less coherent because he at least drew is, the this connection is like, this is he like, at least drew the come connection for the, come for the cringeworthy uh, he at least analogy drew the connection stay for the total lack of synthesis of two right basic at least, banal at least, observations at least thomas freeman did the bad <laughs> synthesis which is they have a nice lifestyle but they have to give it up for this <laughs> horrifying model of globalization i propagandized for she's too dense to even understand how you said how those things intersect uh, I don't know. She's she like, is kind of th there is some type this, of weird nepotism thing. Or yeah, something I was going to say she's this so smells like fucking, a nepotism case. She's so I'm, and I'm talking totally. I mean, of course, it's somewhat. Of course, I don't like her ideology, but there is it's it's a Rubin principle. There's also just like the yeah. guy's stupid. Right? She's it, bad. She's not a good writer. She's not bright. What's going on here? I think her dad's like an APAC neocon and her mom's like a Hillary neolib. So. That's it, not, it I seems, mean, like, I'm talking like there's nepotism. There's probably a ton of those. Too. Yeah, right. Yeah. I'm talking like the nepotism of, like, who made a phone call. Like, what's right. going on? That's right. what I'm talking oh, about. Right. Well, I'm not just talking about the standard issue mediocrity that people like her spawn from. I don't enough. doubt that. It appears that um, our friend and guest Sophie Weiner actually just published a blog post today on Splinter titled Barry Weiss Knows Nothing About Australia. So maybe check it out, folks. All right, folks, going to take a uh, quick break and head into the fun half, wherein we will take your phone calls and your uh, IMs. I am turning on the IM machine, so just take it easy, everybody. Take it easy, okay? See you there. See you there.
We are back, Sam Cedar on the Majority Report. Um, on the I Am, Adam Cokehead, your fun half song is essentially Aziz Ansari's theme song. Uh, let's Aww. go to <laughs> the 266 uh, number on the phone. You're calling from a 266 number. Who is this? Where are you calling from? Hello? Hello? Is this me? Sorry. Yes, it is you. Uh, I take it you are Hello, calling yeah. from abroad. I am, Sam. Yeah, sorry. I've been trying to get through for a few days on the Skype. And, uh, but yeah, um, I may want to call up to wish you guys a Happy New Year and all that. But also... Um, well, well, I'm sorry. Uh, give us your, so your name and uh, where are you calling from? Sounds like uh, you have I'm a Greg. I'm from... Um, New Jersey accent. Uh, I'm Greg. I'm from the UK, but I'm living in Berlin at the moment. Okay, well, uh, Greg, welcome uh, to uh, the the program. Uh, Happy New Year to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I mainly want to call up just to say that uh, from an abroad perspective, um, you guys have been really useful for me, kind of uh, like articulating a lot of my thoughts and even um, like uh, in a European context. And um, I've got a younger brother who has just started university doing his media and um, he had a friend who he was really worried about who was falling in with a bunch of uh, Jordan Peterson, Sam Harris type YouTube videos down that rabbit hole. Oy. And um, he didn't quite know what to do with it. So I sort of said to him, you should check out this guy, Sam Cedar, the libertarian videos, all that kind of stuff. And um, I saw him over the Christmas period. And he said, oh, yeah, you know, my mate. I said, yeah. And he goes, he's completely off that train. Because pretty much I think there's a really strange thing that happens with a lot of those guys where... I mean, we know this about Harris and um, Peterson and all those guys. They invite each other all onto their own programs in this kind of like little echo chamber. So anyone who kind of like lives in that ecosystem on YouTube just sees these guys hanging out with each other and telling each other how intelligent and how great they are. And I think like obviously debate and discussion and stuff like that is a really important thing, but I don't think it can be understated, understated the value of... Um, I think the thing was just seeing this guy watching videos and seeing you guys just laughing at him and ridiculing them. And just be, like, I don't think he was used to seeing that. And then literally, yeah, my brother was just like, yeah, he was just calling me up. They've been sharing videos, all that kind of stuff from you We're guys. We're very so, able um, to do that. I mean, it is, I, you know, I don't know that I've, I've, I've quite, um, I mean, I think that's an excellent point. The, the, the amount of validation that comes when you see all these guys just sort of keep going on their own on their own shows with each other and nodding their head in agreement, um, I mean I think look, the it, it is um, uh, there there are a lot of shows uh, that I think uh, insulate themselves, um, and that's the way that they protect themselves from criticism. And uh, these guys sort of just expand the insulation a little bit uh, bigger and make it look like they're actually open to conversations. But, um, yeah, that's interesting. I, I really hadn't, interesting hadn't occurred ideas. to me that really di dynamic. Ideas. We're going to take that idea. That's why we call it the jerk encirclement. Think, the jerk encirclement, that's right. I think it's, um, I think also as well, because obviously coming from the UK, I mean, I'm, I'm moving back to uh, Britain, like hopefully in the next few months to do a master's and stuff. Um, I think there's so many parallels between what's happened in the US post-2016 election and what we've experienced in the UK with, with Brexit. And um, I wrote, uh, I did an interview with a guy who wrote a book for Zero Books, Brian Culkin, called The Meaning of Trump. And he writes a lot about how sort of, you know, neoliberalism has sort of brought along this collapse and stuff. And um, same as you've seen in the US, I think a lot of left-meaning, left-leaning people are kind of like just floating. They're very, you know, they don't know what's happening. And that idea still of civility and debate and things like that, obviously they're useful things. But also the idea that, you know, like the fight has gotten beyond a point where you can just focus on civility and stuff. Sometimes it can be effective to dunk on people. Sometimes it is effective to say, no, we draw the line here and focus our energy where we actually need it to be and stuff. I think, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, even what you guys were saying with the gentleman calling from uh, Vietnam yesterday, I think, Michael, you were saying, you know, um, over the next few years that we don't know what's happening, but something very serious and quite like significant is happening with the left and liberalism right now. And we kind of need to be ready to have the next step forward from that, as opposed to continuing to try and fight these battles on the rules of a game that clearly have changed yeah. by this point. That's right. 
Yeah, and I, you know, I, I, I think um, I, I, I'm still waiting for someone to, uh, you know, either uh, uh, to to point my attention to, or for someone out there to to write a more in depth perspective on this stuff from a generational standpoint. Because you know, look, the baby boom. It, obviously, it was a post-war phenomena, and I imagine, and I don't know this, but I imagine the um, you had a similar di- a dynamic in the UK, right? I mean, people come home from the war, and then you get this sort of burst of, uh, of, of new families, uh, and I would imagine that the generational dynamics are, are not terribly uh, different uh, around the world. I mean, you know, uh, because it's all a function of the um, of World War Two. But I can I just I'm sorry. Just one other quick plug on a related note. I'm glad that your brother's friend is already done. But uh, Ben Burgess has really good videos for zero books where he actually more so than us. He's he's a logic professor. So he's actually using. Oh, right. Excuse us. Very much so. He had a great debate with a with with some some Jordan Peterson cultist. And what was great was they were debating the viability of worker cooperatives because these guys always are like, oh, uh, logically, uh, the best person needs to make the decision for a business to succeed. <laughs> I think that's pretty basic. And Ben, in addition, is sort of explaining why that's a logical fallacy, which isn't is interesting to me, to be honest. He also was like, well, you know, we can talk about things like Madragon and the workers' cooperatives in Cleveland and stuff. And they're just like, oh, no, you were getting too in the weeds. <laughs> 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 I think we could, uh, we got to get back to first principles here. Exactly. <laughs> ideas, not... F- get I really back think to ideas. anybody who says the words first principles, I think generally is yeah. immediately suspect. No, yeah. that's just, that's basically, yeah. I mean, like what I said just last... training wheels. Yeah, it's like what I said last night, too. It also starts to become like when you argue with a creationist and then you say like the fossil record and they're like, well, the Satan put that there. So I don't accept that's, that that's as That's exactly my point. You might as well say like when you say when you hear uh, first principles, what you might as well hear is someone say, well, the Torah says something exactly. very different. So <laughs> uh, anyways, I, I don't, don't know how think we get uh, Yahweh would appreciate, with you. appreciate the call. Except religious people are usually. Yeah, um, more interesting. One, one last thing I was just going to say quickly regarding what you just said there about the boomers. I, I always get very frustrated speaking to English people or British people who say, oh, yeah, no, at least we're not as bad as America because I've seen something very insidious happening now where at the very least there was some element of class consciousness in the UK over the past 40 years. And in conversations I've had with older people now, I'm 26, I'm talking to people in their mid-30s and even my parents, I'm seeing that sort of disappearing. And I had a conversation with a cab driver taking me to the airport over Christmas. And when we were talking about all these things, he said, Oh, you know, people talk about class and I don't really see myself as, as, as any of that really anymore. I'm just a tried guy trying to get on. And I understood it, but it made me think about that line, you know, you might not be interested in politics, but politics is interested in you. Right. And I really want to say to him, you know, you might not see yourself as a class, but I can guarantee you, Jacob Brees, Smog, Boris Johnson, these people in power who are enacting it, they know what your class is and they know what theirs is. And they know what their interests are, and it's um, it's worrying. But what anyway, if uh, yeah, he's just interested in ideas in getting Appreciate out? The call. What that's if he's what, just interested in his own ideas? That's what right wing populism does. That's what fascism does. It convinces people in the working class that they have interests in common with people in the ruling class, and defines people based on nation and tribe and race and ethnicity rather than you know their clear interests. Maybe he's just trying to get in as a guy who's interested in ideas. Calling from a 509 area code. Who uh, might this be? Um, I don't know my area code. Is this, is this me? <laughs> uh, it is you. And, and who might you be? Hey, this is Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan. How are you, sir? Uh, oh, I forgot to even think to thank you for the wine. In fact, I haven't even opened that box. I had that underneath the stuff, and there's something in there apparently. Wow, well, there's you other are stuff. an ungrateful liquor gift I receiver. Just, you like, you know, like, I just, you know, like, I am so. Crack. I, you I see, see that. You see up. one empty beer bottle and miss the whole bottle of bourbon. What? Wait, one em- it, empty beer bottle? Although all most those, all of those soft drinks are not us, sir. You get your facts straight. What do you mean? Who, those are, who's oh, drinking? Those are, yeah, those you, Matt, from, from Of course. Well, yeah. From I mean, but there's, <laughs> there's also more than one beer bottle in there. Uh, uh, way to stab Boom! Anyway, yeah, Matt has no lawyer. How are you? Well, you threw uh, me under the Reagan. with the Coke bottle. <laughs> well, because those right, are guys, during guys, the day. Please, Shh, Matt. Ronald Reagan's Sam, on the phone. quiet down. we got to settle something. You started with Ronald Reagan. What's, on, what's, what's up? 
Well, I was going to call about that box because there's a gift in there specifically <laughs> for Matt, and That's I right. told you that. I know. I and forgot. I, I totally forgot. I DM'd Matt on Twitter the other day, and he had no idea what I was talking about. Well, boo, I'm sorry. Sam, like, boo, uh, Sam Cedar, boo. Uh, I, it, things boo, have been, Sam Cedar, boo. Th- things have been, uh, I've been, uh, been piling up a little bit on my end, but uh, yes, is that was that it? <laughs> yeah, uh, things, life, tend to, things tend to pile up on my end, too, when I've taken two weeks off. <laughs> that was, um, it was really closer to a week and a half, but go ahead. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to say real quick, I thought Chuck and uh, Nancy really nailed it yesterday. Um, <laughs> they just got right to the point you know they looked very serious and and uh you know professional and the presentation was amazing and uh couldn't imagine somebody doing a better job um you know i'm glad they went with the cream of the crop there and uh uh lots of talk about so that was my sarcastic joke but um lots of talk about the optics which were awful um, right but I also think the content was awful because they right out of the gate they said we agree that we need border security like they they're agreeing with the underlying premise of the whole uh argument about the wall isn't and there isn't there been go- a long term problem with the democratic party is that like for the life of me I can't tell you really what is the democratic party's immigration policy like, right. I mean, well, I can tell you what the Republicans are. It's much easier. Don't like them. Don't want them. Well, they're different versions of the same thing, right? Well, I don't know what the Democratic uh, immigration policy is. I mean, they say we want uh, border security. I think border security is OK. Like, I don't want um, I don't want. You know, uh, people showing up um, at the border with, you know, a uh, with a with a, you know, uh, an anti-tank missile, uh, you know, like like but but, you know, I don't mind having um, uh, customs officials at the border. I just think that they should be waving people through. If you ever well, go if you have the experience of going into the Eurozone in a Schengen country that like that's a very good example of what you're talking about working in the real world. They clearly have a very highly specialized process. If something actually needs or drive to be to Canada, flat, but I'm, right. I'm talking, well, drive. no, but I mean, I'm talking, yeah, right. Or drive through Canada, but I mean, shame, but there is literally, I'm thinking of just that wave through you're talking about for most people are like, where are you going? Why are you here? I'm going to go spend two weeks in Germany. Good. Vacation, visit a friend. Great. Come. Well, yeah, the distinction is that the democratic party upholds the criminalization of migration which, you know, you can have border security without that. Um, migration used to be seen as primarily a labor issue. And then after 9-11, well, the it became thing about it. a so national security think they, issue. They don't they won't say that. But it's it's essential either. that they it's essential that they do, though, because that's like part of neoliberalism. When you have something like NAFTA that basically uh, recolonizes Mexico and makes it easier to exploit workers over there and causes a wave of migration, then you have to trap workers on the other side of the wall. Otherwise, U.S. companies aren't going to be able to exploit them as much. I, I mean, I, I think that that, no. that expresses a, a level of uh, contemplation that goes beyond what I think most Democrats have. That, that's a, that's exactly have my point. That's exactly my point. I, th- really, I think it's an essential part of uh, the whole neoliberal project. I, I, I know I don't I don't disagree with you. I just think the reality is for them, they're, they're governing from a position of fear. Yes. and they're afraid to say anything, you know, this is like it, it, it reminds slightly, me slightly bold. And it's fucking fair. It's just, and plus, it's complicated. And so it's easier to just say we agree I on totally border agree. security. I totally agree. I mean, yeah. because if they really wanted to, if they really wanted to weaponize what you're talking about in an intelligent way, you know, there would be a whole guest worker program that is far more sophisticated and they would set up more means in which to exploit as opposed to just simply saying border security. It reminds me their position on immigration reminds me of like the Democrats in the war on terror, where it's just sort of like we've got to mouth these words and I don't know if we believe them or not, but we don't have time to really think about it. And and that's it. They're they're 
there is a um, a fear, and on some level, I also think, which is you know sort of so hopeful about having someone like AOC and Bernie Sanders say these uh, things that are are more um, uh, direct, is that I think there's more of a vacuum there uh, in that in that policy position than uh, appears. Like it, 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 everything you may be saying about um, you know. Uh, you know what it does for corporations it may be true uh and, and i think it's true i mean obviously you get a um a, you know cheaper labor and but i don't think that there is a cohesion within the democratic party um and i think to the extent that policies that help the agenda you're talking about which i think is largely like the was the republican um a, a agenda for a long time um is gets there because there's just simply a vacuum like there's no there's just simply no strong policy when it comes to immigration uh, there, there are there are interests that that are served by the status quo to be sure but there you know major corporate interests are also heavily lobbying for immigration reform dip, for different reasons than than i want them but uh when immigration reform was supposed to pass in 2013 there was Microsoft and Boeing and, and all of these corporations putting, you know, huge amounts of money into into the same bill. And so it's also true that corporate interests could be served with a with a uh, robust and, and profound immigration reform. Uh, I just think that they it, it's too confusing and, and they're not willing to put the, the, the time to. It's all four corners. It, the, pro, the, the major it's four corners. The, yeah, for them. The major pro, they're just basically trying to draw out the clock. On, on immigration. Exactly. And the real problem with last night is they failed to draw any real distinction uh, between what they're, so, you know, oh, we want to open the government so we can debate this. Well, you just said you want border security, but maybe with nuanced differences with drones or, or other right. technology. And so you're agreeing on the, the faulty premise, which is that uh, the problem with the immigration system is uh, our porous border. Uh, which just is, you know, fundamentally not true. And it, it's a shame that th there have been these stories of brave, undocumented workers who work at Trump properties who've spoken out. There, there was just a story about how they're literally handing out fake green cards at uh, one of his golf courses in New Jersey, and uh, they failed to capitalize on on any of those stories. Uh, you know, hypocrisy is boring, as you always say, but you know they could point out this is a president who doesn't really have a problem with with illegal immigration look at the way he operates his own businesses um yeah i mean and, i guess i mean i think they, they should they, just come out with some type of affirmative actual yes, policy yes right i mean well yeah that's and, the and, main thing and, and i think like forcing the democrats to do that would force them to make a you know some like some choices on this rather than just sort of like this mealy mouth it, it's completely four corners type of situation and you know I, I, maybe they just found it like there's no other option right now because when we push for some type of comprehensive immigration reform, that's what they used to say, right? Which in that, in and of itself, like the details of that proposal, there was some of those things I liked and some of the things I didn't like. Um, but at the very least, you know, go on and say DACA or DAPA. Like just from a political standpoint, um, they're not doing anything. Um, you know, on top of like from a like a pure policy standpoint, they don't seem to be advocating anything anyways. But I think there's I think we are headed at one point to a reckoning on this issue in the Democratic Party. Like the Democratic Party ultimately has to make a decision. Uh, and that is, you know, what is the immigration policy going to be? It can't just be this sort of like, you know, yeah, sort of, but just not so harsh. Like exactly. <laughs> That's a, well, you know, sort of just not so harsh is the new Senate Democratic policy. For it's it's right. a shame the European Union isn't doing. Can better. we do it? Into, can we do it into a hashtag? <laughs> <laughs> As is, my daughter at hashtag Facebook was telling me that similar but not so harsh. Similar but not so harsh. Well, I, I wish you're right. The EU would be. Are you trying to say, Matt, that the EU would be a more helpful? sort of example if it was performing better yeah that could yeah, yeah exactly yeah because I, I remember when i was in, in london yeah. like going to uh france or amsterdam was incredibly Beautiful. easy yeah it was awesome. incredible and then and no and there's no evidence whatsoever like 
there's a backlash to open borders, borders policy in Europe because xenophobia has always been an issue there, period, because of austerity, because of the economic crisis. But there's no correlation with security issues in that. And that's actually in a place where, like, as an example, like refugees coming from Syria, United States, anybody who says that they aren't vetted is a liar, period, full stop. In Europe, there actually was some examples of like, oh, like a huge amount of people are coming here that are, you know, it's just a huge mass and they should come. But we actually need to have some new procedures for vetting them. That was actually a real Look, thing. Yeah, in we Europe. have security at the right. airport. No, that was actually. I mean, a, but I'm saying that's a real thing. No, but in terms of just like literal volume of people, that was an actual thing in Europe. It wasn't all a total lie. Uh, and it could easily be dealt with and handled. My point is that none of that led to any increased security problems at all, period, full stop. So even if the EU is having a lot of problems because of austerity and the rise of fascist parties, the case study still works for us. There, I, the, the most robust example of open borders we had have been nothing but cultural, economic uh, enhancement. On, on the intentionality tip, though, I, I have to disagree a little bit um, a few episodes back, um, we on the Antifada, we talked with a labor historian who spoke about um, bosses in the 1970s were very aware of the fact that um, immigrants from Mexico and elsewhere were active in labor unions and in the labor movement, and they wanted to neutralize that threat, basically, to their interests. Um, and after migration was criminalized, um, yeah, they lost a lot of power uh immigrant workers lost a lot of power to um to, to drive up wages and it actually drove down wages for everyone i, so I mean i have no not... doubt that there have there aren't there aren't specific um um uh, interests that are conscious of it i'm talking about the democratic party yeah so in 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 the year 2018 I mean, if you walked in and sat down with Chuck Schumer and said, like, what is the uh, policy on immigration? I honestly think that he would say the same thing he well, said last night. Whether or not it's uh, conscious and intentional in their minds right now, um, the outcomes are the same. But also they're well, yes. operating within a economic and political framework that was created by these interests in the 70s, whether or right. not they're aware of it. I also think the the framework that they're operating in is that they are afraid of a decent amount of bigotry and misinformation, and Chuck Schumer is just weak, and they don't want to take a position on this. I mean, that's I mean, we're talking about intentionality, but uh, Ronald Reagan. It's the whole, it's the, you know, you want to look tough true. and you want to be strong, and it's the same thing with the uh, crime, right? You know, you got to be tough on crime. Right. Except and, for the uh, fact that crime is down in historical levels across the country in every single um, measure, except for probably uh, financial crimes. Carnage. I would again point to the economic base, though. Like, why? did people spread negative stereotypes about immigrants in the first place? They were afraid that they were going to hurt their, their jobs, their labor. I am not disagreeing with that, but we're talking about something much more limited, which is what is the democratic party's immigration position? Do you know what it is? No. Right. That's all I'm saying. That's exactly right. what I'm saying. I mean, yeah, all of these things can be true. I'm just pointing oh, to Ronald Reagan now back, hung up on. I'm oh, pointing back oh, in time. Reagan. I always want to get to the root, you know, Where did Reagan I understand. Go? I understand. Um, all right, let's, uh, go to, uh, well, let's go to a great thinker on this in terms of, uh, yeah. the walls. Um, of course I'm talking about Dave Rubin who, uh, showed up on some, uh, two boots radio. What is it? Uh, who, why, what two way radio, uh, show two way, two way radio show. Uh, yeah. And, uh, ready. Dave Rubin has, uh, dug deep into this, um, and, uh, this issue and has, uh, picked up the talking points that, where did we see this? Uh, oh, it was Trump. Trump. Yeah. Trump. In the clip talking yeah, about the imaginary walls around the Obama house, I guess. Maybe there are walls around uh, Obama's house. He's a uh, former president. There's uh, some reason to believe that he might be afraid, but the premise, uh, well, let's listen to uh, Dave Rubin. Um, so do you think if they, they're not if, making that argument? They're making an argument about morality. And the simple fact is every one of these people making an argument about morality has a huge wall or fence around their house. And most of them are walking around with security and have cameras and all sorts of things. So you can't tell me a wall doesn't work because you've got one or is an immoral act because right. you've got one around your house. So right. if you're going to take down your wall and take away your guns and your security, 
and then talk about morality. I guess we could do that. But that, that, that just shows you how silly this argument has become. I, 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 Pause it for one second. Now, uh, look, in Dave's mind, uh, imaginarily, the, the people who are talking about the immorality of a wall um, all have guns and uh, video cameras and walls against around their fence. I, I don't know how he would know that. My apartment it's, has walls. The, that you do have walls. It also sometimes the walls hold up the ceiling. Um, but uh, the absurdity of, of Dave's point, of course, is that to argue we need walls on the border, you would also be arguing that we need walls on the northern border. Like, why do we not? What? How is it that we have this map? Like, and I'll remind you, the northern border of this country is more than, I think it's two and a half times the length of the southern border. I don't really know enough about that. Um, I'm going on a plane, but uh, I'll read more. Maybe we should just put yeah. walls around all the states, too. Maybe there should be a wall around the state, but I don't know. I'm going to need to look into that more. Uh, I'm going to need to um, I'm he, gonna be on he, a plane now. He also doesn't understand the difference between an argument about morality and an argument about efficacy. Well, right. he sort of shifted back and forth a little mm. bit. Mm. But, um, Four he, corners. And he doesn't also seem to, to recognize that just like a wall is uh, just the fact that it's a wall does not mean that it serves the same purpose in uh, different contexts. People on the left just hate walls, just as a structure. They uh, hate them. It's unbelievable. And, you know, and kudos to Dave, because I know, uh, Dave, he will, not, uh, he will not see this or hear this. Because, uh, but the funny part is, he will block on Twitter just about anybody who critiques him, except for me, it feels like. He hasn't blocked me either so far. Now, I'm quite sure no. he must have me muted because I don't want to hear those ideas. What I'm, uh, I'm right, but he won't block me because he doesn't want to be seen as shutting down. I mean, this is the, th the thing that sort of uh, really, really, in some ways, I find this the most despicable about him. He won't block me because he knows I have a loud enough platform to talk about how he blocked me and that it would hurt his brand to block me because he's open to dialogue. You never give your enemies content, like right. Drill said. But he will do it. He will block everybody else because, um, it, because they can't make enough of a story of it. But he's afraid of blocking me because he knows that will show up in the next profile that is done uh, by somebody. And that's why he doesn't do it. They figured out, and so my husband and I, we did a <laughs> night-long uh, strategy session on this and came up with the mute strategy. Here you go. So uh, uh, this, oh, yeah, is, this, this is a classic, this is a classic, uh, like, this is a classic conservative argument. This is definitely something so, that takes IQ seriously. Eric Swalwell uh, writes, my favorite part of the conservative outrage responses to this tweet is, but the Berlin Wall was to keep people in argument, missing entirely that a wall is a wall, no matter what side of it you're on, it's medieval. It's a symbol of us, not uh, us and not us. And that is not the U.S., right? So the idea is that a wall is uh, sort of like the uh, antithetical to, say, the uh, Statue of Liberty. That the Statue of Liberty says we welcome uh, immigrants. And a wall is really a memorial to saying we don't welcome immigrants, that we are hostile, that we feel we're under siege. And, and of course, by all possible measures, we are not under siege. I mean, the, the, you remember the recall, the, the rhetoric of the invaders and whatnot. But uh, so this guy, uh, Baseball Crank, who is this guy, Dan McLaughlin? Uh, I think he's like a lawyer or something. Okay. Some the corporate... Vietnam Memorial uh, Wall is also a wall. So is the Wailing Wall. So is the Green Monster. If you're against all walls, regardless of purpose or function, you're against houses, churches, and hospitals. And... I have a friend who got blocked by Baseball Crank. Uh, who because he tweeted at him your law firm's clients should demand a billing rate discount based off of your tweets well i will also say this incidentally um the uh the vietnam memorial wall is there uh, as a way of uh you know as a memorial not to keep people in or out no you it's to keep the Viet walk, Cong. you the actually no. walk around the wall no, it that's doesn't not prevent how it you from works. going anywhere vietnamese the, people don't walk around walls so if it's there they don't walk it off the wailing wall 
was in fact a wall to keep people out. It was part of the, uh, the, the uh, original temple, and it was a way to keep people out. But now it's a wall for, please let my son get into Harvard. <laughs> And uh, the green monster, of course, um, is for baseball purposes. I mean, didn't that destroy Fenway for us, though, as lefties in Massachusetts? Because we're so upset by walls that we just couldn't enjoy I'm a game a of Fenway. A leftist. Oh, a leftist. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm no, saying. I thought you meant because I was like, what? no, because it's, it's a righty. Oh my god, it has more yeah, problems as a righty. Christ, a lefty Sam. will be yeah, a lefty okay. will be going yeah, down yeah, right yeah, field. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Wrong, <laughs> wrong scenario. It, but as we're a writing, making fun it of, really messes with your head. We're you're making fun to, of uh, baseball crank. Back okay. to the task. There you go. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was ready to have some picky issues with the first tweet, but the second one really just blew it away. Um, let's uh, hear uh, Bernie Sanders. Uh, his response. I mean, the idea that there's a crisis um, at the southern border is just simply absurd, and. Um, the, by any stretch of the imagination, I, I, I would say it's a crisis if you're one of those 14,000 children who are being warehoused um, uh, by the U.S. government. It's a crisis if you're one of their family uh, members. Yeah, it's a uh, crisis that the Republicans created. Indeed. But uh, the idea that uh, U.S. national security is in any way implicated by this is just simply um, absurd. And And if it is then Donald Trump is being incredibly negligent. President Trump, you want to talk about crises? At a time of massive income and wealth inequality, tens of millions of our workers are earning starvation wages and are unable to adequately provide for their families. That's a crisis. You want to talk about a national emergency? 30 million Americans have no health insurance and many more are underinsured. Thousands die each year because they don't go to a doctor when they should. And our life expectancy in this country is actually in decline. While the pharmaceutical industry makes tens of billions of dollars a year in profit, one in five Americans can't afford the medicine they need. Now that is a crisis we should be working on right now. And here's another crisis. Too many of our seniors are living in desperate poverty, and about half of older Americans have no retirement savings. Hundreds of thousands of young people cannot afford to go to college in this country, and over 40 million are trying to deal with the outrageous levels of student debt they are experiencing. What are we going to do about those crises? Uh, so there's uh, Bernie Sanders responding. And uh, he had Andrew. the perfect response. He's so good. In the sense that, you know, and obviously he didn't literally say this, but the way he did, he didn't do like any of the, I talked about this last night, like there's none of this like grandstanding, like, oh, how dare he and blah, blah, blah. He just basically said, like, this guy's an asshole. Here's what's actually right. going on. First, we'll deal with with regards to the crisis he's creating with regards to immigration because of his obscene policies. And now here's everything else, like let alone the fake crisis that the demagogue is creating. Here's poverty. Here's climate. Here's health care. Here's inequality. And let's just like get to it. No bullshit. He's actually a very effective communicator. Yeah. As opposed to sort of like trying to sell people on outrage. I mean, more often than not, exactly. if you have to sell outrage then it's not outrageous. And right. when you're overselling outrage, like, you know, when you're selling it, then you're sort of like, you know, uh, you, you're, you're, you're telling the, the listener on some level that, um, that they don't get it. And when, you know, look, the easiest thing in the world to get in this instance is that Donald Trump is a yeah. asshole. Well, it's the easiest thing in the world to get. Yes. But when that's all you have, and you have no real structural ideas to make people's lives better, of course you're going to ha harp on the outrage well, tip. Well, you can also have non-structural ideas to make people's life uh, better, and you just you should go directly towards them. They don't necessarily have to be uh, uh, structural responses. Um, you, don't, you don't even have to have anything, if we're just talking from the standpoint of rhetoric. Um, it's just that there's good rhetoric and there's bad rhetoric. And to the extent that, uh, you know, Bernie Sanders practices 
just better rhetoric. It's just we're just talking in terms of like communication skills. Yeah, it, but he's also got the stuff to back it up. You know, it's true. He's not just a lot of hot air. Negro spiritual in the voice of Mandy Patinkin from the Princess Bride, Latin Rush Limbaugh. My name is Alexandra Ocasio Cortez. You killed my father. Prepare to die. What was interesting about uh, last night? Oh, let me just do a couple more. Jonathan Armstead, uh, Sam, fantastic interview today. I'm going to get some. Uh, I'm going to get this book from my library soon. As someone who attended Head Start, I've always realized that certain programs are poverty. Um, our poverty are super important. And to this point, I'd like to point out that Trump's government shutdown means the USDA only has about a month's worth of funding to provide food stamps to people. Yeah, we had talked about this. I think, you know, like the first week of February is when things become a problem. After that, the government will have no money, which makes Trump's threat to keep the government shut down going a terrorist demand. If you're interested in doing something, you can Google Daily Co's food stamps, shut down cuts, and send a form letter to your representative. Winnipeg, Craig, uh, that Canada in a thong line is a subtitle of Barry's piece. Yeah, it's also from David Sedaris, I think it is. Also, please don't let her talk about us like that. We have our own thongs. Thank you very much. Uh, President Trump, thank you uh, for so many nice comments regarding my Oval Office speech. A very interesting experience. <laughs> Thames Darwin, Sam, as a fellow Jew, I thought I'd share my discovery of recent conspiracy among our people to rival those involving the banks and the media. Apparently a decade ago, a group of powerful Jews met in a room and decided to dose the drinking water of the editors of major publications so that they believe that Barry Weiss can write her way out of a paper bag. I think it worked. <laughs> that, that's the first Zion, Zion or conspiracy that I'm pretty open to. Train boy, Virginia Governor Ralph Northam has introduced a bill to repeal voter ID laws and institutes no excuse absentee voting. Nice. Mary Lee, Jank from TNT, hosting a fundraiser for Namiki in Astoria next Wednesday, 1-6. Maybe you mean 1-16. JB, uh, please call your uh, two senators and representatives today and tell them you want the end to shut down and that you don't want a wall, even though polling supports us on these positions. Folks at the Senate's office says calls were about 50-50 on this. Uh, you know, if you go to the majority.fm site at the bottom, uh, it will show you who your uh, Congress people are, and I think you can click it and get their uh, info. Uh, Ryan from Ohio. What do you guys think about Brian Singer winning a Golden Globe despite being allegedly uh, being guilty of the same crimes as Kevin Spacey? I did not know that he is allegedly guilty of the same crimes as Kevin Spacey. I did not know that he won a Golden Globe. So I do not think much about it, uh, but maybe, maybe unlikely I will look into it. Um, Wisconsinite, uh, hello from the IM machine. We're going to have a border wall and Canada is going to pay for it. A square. Well, guess uh, the Trump show needs higher ratings now that he's staging these performances and keeping the shutdown. Or is it reelection or the madness? I suspect that the reason why uh, Trump uh, wrote that thing about the uh, forest fires in California was specifically like, got to change. Yeah, the show. Like that away. is the most naked, obvious use of that attempt. But 100 percent. All right. Here's what's uh, here's what's interesting. Um, last night, and generally, look, I think uh, Shep Smith and uh, Chris Wallace are, um, uh, let me put this, um, but I, I don't want to say useless, but of very little loose, like use. Big leaves? Yeah, yeah. But uh, last night, interestingly, they were uh, on the anchor desk. During the Trump speech and, you know, like uh, that caller who told us, you know, uh, one of the things the uh, the intellectual dumb web does is they all go on each other's shows and nod and, and sort of self um, they they uh, they're, they're sort of like a self licking ice cream cone in terms of the, their own intelligence and their deep thoughts. We're all. Yes, I'm I'm, I'm confirming that you're very intelligent um, based upon your confirmation that I'm very intelligent. And uh, of course, I must be intelligent because you're intelligent. And if you think I'm intelligent, then definitely we're both intelligent. And I'm here, too. Uh, the, <laughs> and I'm, I, I'm, I'm doing the debate. I'm and, present. And, <laughs> and, um, on some level, that's what happens at Fox. But uh, in a moment where you have um, the more skeptical and the guys who uh, their brand is to pretend like they're journalists at Fox News, um, 
I imagine there was a little bit of dissonance uh, with the uh, Fox audience after Donald Trump got done with his speech. Here is Shep Smith. President Trump speaking from the Oval Office. In a short time, there will be a response uh, from the Democrats. He made a number of claims there, uh, speaking specifically about uh, murder rates among those who are undocumented immigrants. The government statistics show that there is less violent crime by the undocumented immigrant population than by the general population. He called it a crisis of the heart and soul. He talked about drug crossings over the border, but government statistics show much of the heroin actually comes not over the unguarded border, but through ports of call. Uh, he talked about undocumented crossings over the past the past months. In fact, the number of undocumented crossings over the southern border has been steadily down over the last 10 years, and the government reports that there is more outward traffic than inward traffic. As for the trade deal he mentioned with Mexico, which he said would pay for the wall, that trade deal is not yet complete. And the president said that uh, law enforcement professionals have requested the $5.7 billion. It's he who requested it, and it's he who said he would own the shutdown. Nevertheless, he's making the case to keep his base together on this matter. Chris Wallace is live with us in Washington. Does that make the case, Chris, for his base? Well, it certainly does make the case for his base. The question is that uh, whether the base is enough, and the answer is it isn't, because the Democrats, in an election in which the border wall was a major issue, took control of the House, and they have enough votes in the Senate also to block any legislation <clears throat> there. You know, in the movie The Godfather, they talk about making an offer that you can't refuse. The president tonight was making an offer the Democrats can't accept. Uh, one thing he talked about was the shutdown, and he kept saying it, that there's a shutdown because the Democrats refused to fund the wall. The Democrats have just passed a bill to fund every agency in the government, including the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, it's the president and the Republicans in the Senate who've refused to pass that. Uh, so there you have it. I mean, uh, just some of the, um, uh, the I guess, the, the Fox uh, News viewers getting just a slight bit of time. Now, I, I don't imagine there's going to be some type of mass exodus, but you got to wonder, like, it's got to get into the bloodstream a little bit, right? I mean, they have to sort of hear that and go, they can go like, well, Fox is, what, what's going on with Fox these days? I think they actually have built a certain immunity because they've, They've always, I don't know, I know less about Wallace, but certainly um, Shep has always been a pressure valve. But they don't see, that's the thing, is that Shep is on at like what, like two in the afternoon? Oh, okay, you're talking. I'm I mean, talking like yeah, the primetime viewership so. is like six times what it is in the, in the afternoon. They're waiting for Hannity. That's true. And they're, they're well, waiting for Hannity. Yeah, they're like the opening act before the Rolling Stones come out. Get the fuck off the stage. <laughs> I want to have Hannity lie to me now. But I mean, that's I mean, that's what I wonder if if something like that actually um, actually impacts a certain number of their viewers, because, you know, Shep being on in uh, in primetime, you got to imagine that's pissing uh, Sean Hannity off. Sure, too. it's pissing Sean Hannity off. Right. Like Maybe some lawyers have told them that Fox is actually susceptible to some type of mass class action suit for like prematurely aging right. dumb old people. And they're like, wait a second, we need to actually bring their cortisol levels down. Maybe doing we like, should have like a low live broadcast, low live one tonight. There's some like CTE type effect on just Fox News viewers. <laughs> yeah. Now, before you start to think that somehow uh, Fox News viewers are getting the truth because Shep Smith and Chris Wallace were um, fact checking, I guess, if you could call it, uh, President Trump's um, Oval Office address last night. Uh, the next morning, as these Fox viewers wake up and they can just tell themselves, oh, it all must have been a bad dream, because here is, what's her name, Ainsley Earhart? Yeah. Ashley uh, Ainsley. Her name is Ashley Ainsley. Is it Ashley Ainsley? No, that okay. is how I prefer to think of her. It's Earhart. I like how there's Ainsley Air Earhart. Earhart. Um, she uh, basically convinces those Fox viewers, like, what you heard last night, contrary to... Uh, that in any way refuted what uh, President Trump said was just a bad dream. Let me tell you the, the real, not so much truth. 
Ocean. A few things really hit home. When you think about how hard you work, you're waking up this morning, you're trying to put food on the table, you're going to work. Many people go to jobs that they don't like. And then you look at the numbers. You're spending about $80,000, a little more than $80,000 over the course of one of those illegals' lifetime to keep them here in the United States. You're paying for them, and you're working hard to pay for them. Then you look at the numbers of people well, that are doing illegal. First off, that's not true. First of all, the number is not true, 80,000 per uh, uh, undocumented immigrant. That is just simply not true. Uh, uh, and the, uh, the, number, the number to you as an individual uh, it, it, that it would even cost you, even if that was true, $80,000, uh, would be pennies. Um, and the uh, billions of dollars, actually, that you're spending on uh, things like ICE and uh, a would-be wall would dwarf that number. Remember, undocumented immigrants, if they're here, the way that they're feeding themselves is by working. And if they're working, they're kicking in to Social Security uh, unless their employers are uh, ripping them off, but it's very possible if they're if they're posing as as uh, as, as citizens, they're kicking into Social Security. But guess what? They're never going to get the money back. Can you guess what organization that eighty thousand dollar number comes from? Uh, is it uh, there? KVK? Oh, yeah. There you go. Yeah. And 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 I'm I'm sure it's been debunked, but it's just a they've just picked up a number. I mean, that's basically it. But good paying for them and you're working hard to pay for them. Then you look at the numbers of people that are doing illegal drugs here. A lot of the illegal drugs are coming from the southern border and the president highlighted that last Pause night. It. And then to the extent that there are any drugs coming from the uh, the southern border, they are coming through ports of entry. Every single organization that works in terms of drugs says that the vast majority, 80 to 90% of drugs that are smuggled into this country enter in at a legal port of entry. They just can't find them in the cars or they're built into or they're, you know, in the, in the cargo of the plane or somebody's wearing the drugs or whatever it is. That's the way they come in. They don't come in like in this big caravan in the middle of the desert. That's a little bit more explicit. Um, but yeah, these are sophisticated operations. Legal drugs are coming from the southern border, and the president highlighted that last night. And then you hear him talk about, he said something, he said, imagine if this were your child that were killed by an illegal alien. Because we hear Kate Steinle's parents, we heard the parents of the fire chief parents that were in Knoxville, Tennessee, their young son was killed by. The Steinle family has said to stop mentioning us. in the Steinle, right. right. Repeatedly. Repeatedly that were in Knoxville, Tennessee, their young son was killed by a suspected illegal immigrant. You, we heard about uh, Officer Singh in California this week or last week and uh, talked to his family and many of you contributed to pay, pay off his mortgage. He will never be there to see his little boy grow up. The president highlighted the Air Force veteran in California that was raped and murdered and beaten to death with a hammer by an illegal alien. He talked about the, the Georgia illegal alien that killed his neighbor, beheaded him and dismembered him. He talked about the MS-13 gang members in Maryland that are unaccompanied company minors that were arrested and charged with stabbing and beating a 16 year old girl you hear all of that and you wonder why nancy pelosi and chuck schumer are calling this they're not they're right. saying it's immoral to build a wall they're saying it's not a crisis look at the video listen no. to the numbers no. <laughs> it was a um, oh, things really oh sorry was it? it was molly tibbetts who i was thinking of that said like hey stop mentioning us every time you want to fear monger about immigrants i, I mean it's um you know, that's basically there's your your healthy dose of uh, Fox News trying to scare uh, you about uh, immigrants in the morning. And this is the fight. But they're losing. They're losing this battle. Um, and that's just the reality of it. They're um, the the. Um, the Cato Institute. Found that the arrest rate for undocumented immigrants in Texas, for example, was 40% that uh, below that of native-born Americans. I mean, you could go on there and you could spend the entire two hours of uh, whatever it is, Fox and Friends in the morning, uh, just listing off horrific acts by native-born uh, Americans <laughs> in terms of killing. Uh, in fact, they make shows and shows and shows of these. Uh, on Discovery ID. The Check out RealJewelFacts.org. 
you choose her always do it if you ever have to hold hands with the mother it's dot gov now it's dot gov and yeah. and the jews um, if you talk to a mother whose son is in a usury <laughs> and shylock wants blood no matter what <laughs> no it seriously is the really fascist shit it's pure fascism and it's and it is it, what's astonishing is like yes they lie about the numbers but everything else I mean, is exactly what you said it's as simple as repeating random horrific acts that happen to be committed by undocumented people this is the formula this is and the that's formula. how breitbart built <laughs> their course. whole website of out. course i mean going back to even like that war on christmas video like do you know there is a there's an elementary school in Wisconsin where they took the words Jesus out of Silent Night. Fuck like, yeah. <laughs> you know, we, we make the comparison to Nazi Germany, but actually, if you look at publication history in this country, in like the 1830s and 40s, a lot of uh, newspapers were sold off of like escaped slave stuff. And then that also that morphed into criminalizing based on race. That was a very like when this was being. Yeah, the slaves are escaped. And like, they're coming where do you and think raping Germany and murdering. Exactly. That, that's what I'm trying to say. Right. Like we, we, we can kind of. Uh, uh, I guess is it Edward Said like orientalized to Nazi Germany a little bit like no, this is not us right. but this is we yeah. we yeah. helped we helped set the Nazi Germany playbook it's just fun to do well the, the fact voice. is is that uh, Americans are innovators is what you're saying we've always been a uh, uh, key we've disruptors al- and innovators in the fascism been, vertical we've always been on the forefront of this type of stuff yeah and to uh, say people, otherwise is to, to a lot of people talk yeah. about American Nazi Germany or apartheid South Africa like. They did it without American ingenuity. Yeah, when people say things like, this is not America, like, mm, what America have you been living in? I think there's a double-edged sword to that because it's also important to recognize that there's been more than just white populations in this country from, like, the the founding of any of the colonies. So, like, you don't want to forget about those people too, but as far as, like, the ruling structure, definitely. Uh, meanwhile... Um as a Jewish constituent of uh, Chuck Schumer's, um, hello, I, hello, this is Chuck Schumer. Finally, uh, Bor Shepstein oh, uh, speaks to me, and um, <laughs> oh, that's got to be I'm, good. Yeah, Epstein no, on ready. Schumer. I am ready to hear this. Uh, as you know, the Democrats in the Senate have said we will move no legislation until the, um, the government shutdown is over one of those pieces of legislation uh is a larger package of uh, of aid and this and that for uh, israel and other uh, middle eastern countries but buried in that is the marco rubio um plea to uh some of the elderly um and wealthy uh, jews in west palm beach uh basically saying uh that Cr- cr- is it criminalizing if you are an entity that participates in the boycott divest uh, movement uh, of Israel? I mean, this is I mean, look, you can um, disagree with the idea of a boycott, but the concept of criminalizing a boycott um, in this instance, I mean, I, I don't know if it's unprecedented, but it's shocking. How do you even enforce that? I think it has to do with federal contracts. So it's federal contract. Mm, I mean, so sense. it's you're not. I don't know that you're actually criminalizing it per se, but you're basically saying you're not eligible. Like you're blocking their free speech. You could like, say Trump, it very explicitly. Well, yes. you're destroying their free speech. Yes, legally, it is unconstitutional. I would argue, uh, it, but they're not criminalizing the speech. But they're uh, the government is acting in an unconstitutional way. But. You can't even I, I think the, the uh, Trump administration has rolled back the regulations that the Obama administration put in that you would rescind government contracts for employers that have stolen their employees wages. So you could literally steal the wages of your employees. But if you avoid buying Israeli made products, then you're ineligible for that's that was the, that's the legislation Steal they're trying to pass. Wages, he really is stunning. use the savings to invest but, in a settlement. It's perfect. But I want to hear Boris Epstein on this before I really make my mind up. Here's the bottom line. I do wonder, for example, how the Jewish constituents of Chuck Schumer in New York or of Nancy Pelosi in California feel about the direction that the Democratic Party is taking. Honestly, it is disgusting to me that this is not the first time I've had to say this on air. Anti-Semitism has no place in our country, period. 
Well, uh, speaking as a, a constituent of Chuck Schumer's and as a Jew, um, I would say F you, Borish. Uh, in fact, I think if you find, uh, I don't know if they allow you to Google anything outside of the uh, Sinclair Studios there. <laughs> But uh, I think if you did, you would find that about 75 percent of us Jews um, uh, uh, actually uh, support a, a, a more skeptical look at Israel. And uh, I don't know what the support for, for BDS is, but uh, I think it's I don't think anyone I, I, the vast majority of Jews um, who are the most reliable Democratic uh, voting bloc or maybe number two, I think it is. Um, don't have a problem with the direction. I think most of them would also want the Democratic Party to capitulate less to uh, right-wing Israelis, um, which, you know, uh, sadly is increasingly, uh, describes increasingly a larger uh, portion of the, uh, of, the, of the body politic in Israel to um, be more humane and uh, stop imposing a uh, an apartheid um, regime uh, in regards to the Palestinians. Sounds so, like some real internalized anti-Semitism you got going on there. Well, I guess so. But I mean, here Bo is line Bo bottom. Borish asked, and so I wanted to answer. Um, here is line bottom. Sam see the hate Jew self. Donald Trump has different approach. Strong Israel. President does un. Conventional approach, which many find controversy, but Israel will be strong. That's the way it is. Fuck you, Matt Black. You do nothing on Twitter. I hate you. Uh, there's Boris. How much does he get paid? Do we find that out? Three he gets paid three hundred thousand dollars a year. What the? Fuck? Jesus Christ. And <laughs> all right, you know now, what? Here's I'm a real question. Do I, you think he writes his own stuff? Yes. Do you think so? Yes. Oh, all right. Well, in that case, it's no, definitely I do worth like it. Somebody, I, do, I don't know. In that yeah. case, it's definitely worth it. That's like almost the league minimum yeah. salary. I didn't realize he was. I, 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 I didn't realize he was Incredible. actually writing his own material. I thought he was just a uh, talking head. Well, in that case, yeah. He no, I would, it was, uh, he should be getting for four and a quarter. It was Donald. too. It was too good. It was too erudite for him to have written it himself. And uh, it's quality stuff. There. Donald Trump makes decisions that are hard. Liberals don't like, but hard decisions will be made. That's the bottom line. <laughs> um, all right, we got time for um, a couple of. Um, oh, this is a good story. Um, let, let's just I, I just play this one more clip of uh, of Bill De Blasio here. Um, this is good. I mean, this is a function. What we're seeing right now across the country, we get um, uh, in California, uh, Gavin Newsom has introduced a, um, uh, a, a public option or proposal in Washington State, was it? Um, we have uh, uh, Jay Inslee proposed a public option for his state. I mean, this was something that people were hoping for in the Affordable Care Act. Newsom has uh, rolled out a single-payer plan, I should say, for California. It's very difficult for uh, a state to, to do this on their own. Uh, it really needs to be something that's federal. But um, the, the idea of these proposals coming out, and de Blasio has come out with a public option that basically fills a gap that Medicaid, where Medicaid does not cover uh, undocumented immigrants and others. Here is de Blasio uh, making that announcement here. It is good to see mayors and governors stepping up Although all of these things should be instituted on a federal level, there should be no need for this. But from a political standpoint, uh, it's good to exert this pressure. Everyone is guaranteed the right to health care. Everyone. For too many New Yorkers, they, they live in fear. They live in fear of getting sick. They don't know where to turn. They don't know how they're going to afford health care. About 600,000 New Yorkers do not have any health care coverage at all. 600,000 people with nowhere to turn except the emergency room, which is exactly the last place we want to see people go. Today, we take a huge step forward. When this plan 
is fully implemented. Every New Yorker who needs a doctor will have an actual doctor with a name and a place. They're going to have a card that will empower them to go to that doctor whenever they need, and the specialty services that will make all the difference. We take the public option that is Metro Plus, we build it out, we strengthen it, we get it to more and more people. NYC Care is going to make a difference. For those who can afford something, they'll pay on a sliding scale. For those who can't afford anything, care will be for free. No one will be turned away. I can safely say guaranteeing health care for all New Yorkers is one of the big steps to becoming the fairest big city in America, and we're going to do it. Uh, that's good stuff. Um, and uh, Jay Inslee uh, announced yesterday that um, they're going to uh, propose a uh, publicly run health insurance option for state residents. And these, they, they, look, this is going to be available to a limited number of people. There's only 10 million people in the country who uh, get their uh, health insurance through the, uh, the Obamacare exchanges. The difference in Washington will be, and I don't know what the figure is in Washington, but let's presume it's um, several hundred thousand people. They will have a public option that will enter into the marketplace. It will be able to deliver uh, health insurance at a cheaper uh, price point because there's no profit. They're not looking to make a profit. And um, it will have, obviously, the minimum standards set by uh, the Obamacare. It may go further than that. I'm not sure. Um, this is something that we should be able to see in, in, every, in every state. Um, the, um, it's expensive. We, obviously, it should be a, a, a federal thing. But the, the concept of this, it just simply gets cheaper the more people you bring into it. And, um, and and which is why what we really should be doing is just expanding uh, Medicare to cover everybody. Um, and hopefully that's where we're headed. The um, the budget committee chairman, John Yarmuth, Democrat from Kentucky, basically requested from the CBO um, a uh, basically a score, if you will, um, it requested a report on the design and policy considerations lawmakers would face in developing a single-payer health system uh, proposal. So it's basically looking like, give us your projection of costs for various things. And this is what you need to do to start to build an actual, real construction of policy so that you can actually see, like, what, what's going to save us money? What's going to cost us money? What's going to provide better care? What's going to provide worse care? And this is what this is exactly what they should be doing. It's very encouraging. They're doing it on day, you know, five or whatever it is. Uh, obviously, nothing can happen until Democrats control of both houses and the presidency. But um, this is where you start. So this is this is all good, as they say. All right, we got time for one more phone call. Oy, barely, and uh, then I'll do a couple IMs. We'll get out of here. Call from a seven five seven area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Uh, yes, this is Gray Krieger from Virginia Beach. Um, I, I was just trying to make two quick points um, about Elizabeth Warren and the uh, Native American heritage, um, well, sort of just continuing the defense of it and continuing to talk about it. Um, there, there is, there is something in this country like the history of this country, the, the Native American uh, princess myth. I don't know if you all are familiar with it or not, but I've actually been reading about it in um, this book, The uh, Indian Manifesto. Um, and it's just, it basically is, just talks about how it's, it was initially some, it's a holdover from the colonies uh, sort of passed down through family heritage uh since then, and based off of a sort of a indis, I mean, a terrible premise to begin with, but um, more to the point, uh, yeah. it um, sorry, two um, quick points you said. The native, yeah, yeah, the na the Native American um, when, yeah, basically, it's, I'm just saying that it, it's it's uh she she can't defend it and. She know, she should know better 
to know that there is that his, an, an entire hereditary history of people that just want to have a blood tie to the land and sort of the man that sort of believe in the manifest destiny that they are sort of invest in this land too. And okay. at the same time, sort yeah. of, I think I, uh, justi- listen, uh, do, all right, you know, so, you know? Yeah, all right, she's thank, oblivious to all that. She's oblivious to all that. She's not good on that. Wandering doll is all everybody. Appreciate the wandering doll is all. Um, it's true folks. It's really true. Bernie Trump. I, I think, you know, uh, from a political standpoint, uh, I think, you know, she had, she just was could not figure out how to deal with the. Uh, it's because people don't read Adolf Reed and they're essentialists, and she missed the point. But we've already covered well, this a million times. Yeah, so let's I get mean, going. Yeah, it's. Let's get I think going. it's largely uh, irrelevant, except for just you know how do the political machinations uh, play out? Um, I think you know she could have gotten by without reading Adolf Reed and just simply gone no. to uh, you know various uh, stakeholders. She would and have say, gone What's to your... them if she read Adolf Reed. Is my point. Well, she could have just gone to them if she was smart about politics. Yeah, yeah either way. <laughs> and 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 that and would have been would helpful. She would be smart about politics if she read Adolf Reed. I, I need that sound of the. Like, <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't. I hope she learned her lesson. Doesn't get baited into any more of read Adolf Reed's stupid stuff with, with Trump. He's been a great. Oh yes, you, everyone right? should read Adolf crazy? Reed for yeah. sure. Adolf Maybe Reed's not great. his his more recent work. I disagree with a lot of it, but his uh, his classics are indispensable. Yeah, thanks for the quick points, buddy. Uh, <laughs> all right, we're gonna do a couple IMs and get out of here. Um, Binder Dad, thank you, Sam. Much pre- appreciated. Left his best. We'll see you at the show. Bingo Mosquito, Washington Governor Jay Inslee. Yes, uh, Cascade Care, Correction Public Option. Yes, indeed. Mighty Max, what's a brief but effective way to respond to people? How will Democrats pay for the ambitious policies people like AOC wants to pass? Let's be honest, she didn't really answer it when Anderson Cooper asked her. Um, Yes, she did. You could roll back. I mean, there's a very easy way to do this. Roll back the, the, uh, the Trump tax cuts. Don... End of story. Skull and boners. Uh, trying not to be negative person in 2019, but I keep hoping Trump was going to pull a primetime Bud Dwyer. Le- oh, my God. That's not nice. I remember that. Wait, what was that? That's not what the guy who. Yeah, yeah, yeah oh, that's That's pretty. Bad. Gregory from Oklahoma, a friend of mine uh, from my hometown, messaged me today, said she was watching the show and heard someone named Gregory from Oklahoma call into the uh, show, and she wanted to know if it was me. I had no idea that I wasn't the only person in my hometown who was a listener of the show. She told me that she's trying to turn her little brother into a fan of the show because she caught him watching Jordan Peterson the other day. We're the antidote. Shout out to Laura. Here you go. Here you go. Laura. Don't watch those guys. Turn them off and watch them instead. Jerry Bear, couldn't the Democrats get anybody with more life in their eyes to give a response? Last night it was debating whether Trump or Chuck or Nancy looked more... Ridiculous. I'm not quite sure what they, based on what are they thinking this makes more like sense for them to go there. I don't know. Uh, Seb Gorka as business card, a new pickup line. Girl, you're so fine, but you don't realize it. You're the Australia of people. Uh, Adam Cokehead. <laughs> Your fun half song is, yeah, I read that. Uh, Mitch from Houston. Am I the only person who knows former Republicans have become disillusioned with the GOP since the election Trump? I feel like there should be a few more people out there in the same boat. Um, you're not the only one, but there's just not that many. AJ, quick question. I have an uncle that's a Democrat, says that because Cory Booker votes for Bernie Sanders 91% of the time, that Booker is a progressive. How does one argue against this point? Similarly, he thinks that the media is uh, not biased against Sanders. What can I uh, point him to prove that he's wrong? Thanks for the show, MR crew. Well, I don't know. I mean, first off, you could. It, it depends on what you want to define as a progressive. But Cory Booker has uh, pushed uh, charter schools dramatically back in the day. He uh, also took a lot of money from uh, Wall Street. He's been fortunate in terms of the time that he's been in the Senate. He hasn't had to take votes that have been dramatically uh, difficult. And I would also look at that nine percent of those votes. I won't wonder what those are. Uh, he had to be pushed like hell to support Obama's Iran deal. I'll tell you that. And uh, on this Israel boycott, I don't think he was on the right side of that. And he humiliated himself and flipped on uh, pharmaceuticals from yes. Canada. So his first instincts are bad. He's smart enough to be pushed, which is a good thing in a politician, but not in a leader. 
I don't know how biased uh, against Sanders uh, the media is. I think um, you know there's a I think there's a structural issue with the media on anything that is to the left of like. I mean, really, you know, I don't know uh, Chuck Grassley, frankly, but. which leads to a bias against social Democrats. Like yeah. AOC too. Did you see how Anderson Cooper was treating her like she was a crazy fact, child? Yeah, you did a video on it. Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, I just feel like it's not the most important argument to be having. If you're going to talk about somebody about Bernie Sanders, talk about his policies and stuff and not yeah. how unfairly he's being treated. I, I, I just, I think, you know, like, look, you know, he's, he's had more opportunities than the vast majority of non Senate leader Democrats to go on television than any other Democrat uh, in the past three years. Um, I mean, that's just, you know, um, and so he has the opportunity to go out there and speak to the public, which I think is really, um, you know, about as good as you can ask for. Um, Dr. Chaos MD, the exodus of TSA officers continue. Their staffing levels are decimated. Do you think they'll be able to reform that institution so it's less oppressive? Well, I don't know that the TSA is really that oppressive. Uh, you may be conflating them with um, the custom and borders. Uh, It'd be cool, though, you go in there just like, dude, keep your shoes and belt on. Right. <laughs> Enjoy your flight. Is there is there oppression and harassment of the general public necessary to keep the power structure for keeping? I I, I think this must be. I'm really tired of taking. I think that's got to be. I mean, profiling maybe is what they're talking about, but mm. generally it's just theater. Street legal. How do you uh, think about boiling down the answer of how do you pay for it to just uh, you put it in the budget like we pay for everything else. Yes, but I think, look, the easy thing to do is just if you're talking about, you know, mass consumption. Personally, um, I, the, I think it's not the most accurate answer and it's not really sort of the, the best answer. You know, I don't think that we need to pay for it in the way that we're talking about. We can print money if we wanted to. But the easiest thing to do from a rhetorical standpoint is say, roll back the $1.5 trillion in tax cuts to corporations. End of story. Uh, Meg, why, uh, terrible watching the sh shutdown stretch on here in Canada. If Parliament couldn't pass a budget, it triggers a new election, if only indeed. Uh, Hogan and Fanboy. A solid Stuart Varney segment on Fox and Friends this morning where he sarcastically chastises Ainsley Airhead after she claimed taxpayers shouldn't have to pay for illegals. Pretty sure that sarcasm was lost on her and she actually thought she was getting scolded. And the final I am of the day. Rand Paul voted for boycotting Israel, making boycotting Israel illegal, free speech, and small government. Right? Constitution. 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 See you tomorrow. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want, but I know somehow I'm going to get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught between the truth and the light bar. Somehow I lost my drive